Uh, good afternoon. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11826 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Social Security Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to say so now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11826. Formally moved. Thank you very much. Uh, no one has spoken against it, therefore the question is that motion 11826 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And before we move on to the bill itself, uh, members will be aware that British Sign Language interpreters are present in the chamber and will be interpreting this afternoon's business. And I'm sure you will join me in welcoming them today. So we now move on to stage three proceedings on the Social Security Scotland Bill. In dealing with amendments, members should have with them the bill as amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 18A, the second revised marshalled list, and the groupings. And the division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon, and the period of voting for that first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, there will be one minute for the first division following a debate. And members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak buttons as soon as, pos as possible after I call that group. So we turn now to the Marshall Group of Amendments and I call Amendment 17 in the name of Jackie Bailey, grouped with Amendment 18. Jackie Bailey to move Amendment 17 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I wish to move Amendment 17 in my name. It is a very simple one-word amendment on which I hope that the entire chamber can agree. Um, members will know that several equality groups called for the introduction of a principle in Section 1 of the Social Security Scotland Bill, which would embed equality in our social security system. My colleague, Mark Griffin, lodged a number of amendments to the bill at Stage 2, supported by the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights in Gender and Scottish Women's Aid. All but this one were agreed. Now, I know in the way of these things that behind the scenes, there have been discussions between officials of the Scottish Government and CRER in Gender and Women's Aid, but no conclusion reached prior to the amendment deadline for Stage 3. Hence, it is before the Chamber today. I believe the Scottish Government's intentions are good, but essentially the language within the bill as it stands is weak. The thinking is that rather than promoting the goals of equality and non-discrimination, the Scottish social security system, and indeed other public bodies, should actually deliver it. Under the Equality Act of 2010, all public authorities are required to advance equality of opportunity between persons who share a relevant protected characteristic and persons who do not share it. This ties the principles into the Equality Act and provides legislative backing for that requirement. The principle would be considerably strengthened by this change in wording. This wouldn't simply be about duplicating Equality Act obligations because research shows us that public bodies are not fully aware of their duties and often don't adhere to them properly. So having this on the face of the bill would align with the Scottish Government's equalities responsibilities under the Scotland Act of 1998 to promote compliance with equalities legislation. And above all, presiding officer, it would be the right thing for this parliament to do. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Adam Tompkins to speak to Amendment 18 and the other amendment in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 18 uh, in, the, in my name in this group is designed uh, to continue and hopefully to complete um, the work that was started, Presiding Officer, at Stage 2 uh, when we were seeking in the Social Security Committee to clarify the legal effect of the principles on which the Scottish social security system is to be based. We all accept and agree um, with the Scottish Government's proposition that the Scottish social security system should indeed be based on a set of agreed principles which are listed um, at the beginning of this legislation in Section 1. But turning that policy intention into statute law um, runs risks uh, that there will be unnecessary litigation that is designed simply to clarify in courts or tribunals what the legal effect of those principles uh, might be, even if we are all agreed on their political effect. And Section 1A uh, of the, uh, of the uh, bill, which was um, uh, added 
um, at stage two is designed to start that work of clarifying um, uh, what the legal effect of the principles is to avoid the risk of unnecessary uh, future uh, litigation. Uh, and this Amendment 18 um, uh, is designed, as I say, to complete that work. So it simply um, clarifies that the statutory purpose of the Scottish Social Security principles is so that they can be reflected in the Charter, um, which we will come to in a few moments, uh, and indeed so that the Scottish Commission on Social Security can have regard to them uh, when making recommendations as required by um, uh, the various provisions of this bill that pertain uh, to the Commission. These are, this is an amendment which has been, I think, agreed with the Government, and I'd like to thank the Minister for her help in having it uh, drafted, and that is its point, and I move it. Thank you, and I call on the Minister, Jean Freeman, to respond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very conscious we have a great deal to get through this afternoon and into this evening, so I'm happy to simply say that I support both amendments in this group, both of which I believe provide additional strengthening to the Bill. Thank you. Admirable, admirable brevity. Uh, I call on Jackie Bailey to wind up. Um, on that basis, I'm delighted. I don't need to add anything else, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That is agreed. Can I call Amendment 18 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated? Adam Tompkins to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. That is agreed. Call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move Amendment 19 and to speak to all amendments in Group 2. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group are minor and technical adjustments to improve the structure of the Bill, improve the consistency of expression across sections, add some clarifications and make some minor fixes. We have already provided detailed information to business managers, so I don't believe I need say much more about these amendments. But I do want to indicate my support for Amendment 104 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. And having said that, I move Amendment 19. Thank you very much. And Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 104 and other amendments in the group. Uh, President Officer, thank you. Can I uh, very briefly just move uh, Amendment 104 my name? It's a technical uh, turning up, which I think just gives clarity to the role of the uh, law and upper tribunals and that of the Commission. And I'm grateful to the Minister and her officials uh, for the help in drafting this motion and need, I'm happy to support all the other uh, amendments in this section which the Minister has just moved. Thank you very much. Does the Minister wish to add anything to the way of winding up remarks? No, I'm fine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sorry, Jeremy Balfour. Te technicality. I should have said at the start of uh, this debate today that I should declare uh, that I am in receipt of a higher rate of PIP, um, which is on my and to declare that at this stage is one of the benefits that we'll be dealing with later. Apologies. Thank you, Mr. Balfour, for noting that for the official report. So we move on to the question. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We move now to Group 3. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've taken a strong interest in the question of whether benefits uh, can be automated or to, to those who are entitled. Uh, we know from uh, DWP estimates that £13 billion pounds a year are not claimed by people who are entitled to assistance, and in Scotland that could be as many as 500,000 individual cases. I'd like to put on record my thanks to the Scottish Government and the Minister Jean Freeman for working with me to put these amendments together, as I know she is committed, as I am, to making sure uh, that where we can make it easier for people to get benefits they're entitled to um, and this will be go, go beyond this bill, I know, and we did it in the Child Poverty Act. So, uh, moving Amendment 1 and speaking to Amendment 11. Amendment 1 is the recognition of the importance of the available data that simply means that ministers can use the data on the first application to ensure that they can use that to assess whether uh, someone might be eligible for another benefit. Uh, amendment 11, I think, is the, the important um, amendment here because it places a duty on Scottish ministers to either inform the individual that they may be eligible for assistance and provide information about how to apply for that assistance or allow for a more automated determination 
of whether that person can receive that without making any more applications. And I think that is the important thing here, that once you've made an application, then there's a duty on the agency to ensure that if you're entitled to any other benefits, um, then the agency can assist you in doing that. Uh, I move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Ruth Maguire to speak to Amendment 20 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, presiding officer. I move Amendment 20 and 21 in my name. I'm grateful to Mark Griffin for his support with this amendment, as well as the support provided by stakeholders, in particular the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. In encompassing all of the information which the Act requires ministers to make publicly available, this amendment would also cover information such as posters, information leaflets and appointment information, as opposed to only the more formal types of documents listed under 1D. Perhaps most importantly, in contrast to 1D, my amendment ensures that communication accessibility is mainstreamed and normalised, as opposed to only implemented on an individual and proportionate basis. Under 1D, a person would have to know where to go and then ask for accessible information. In addition, the use of the term proportionate um, implies that the provision of communication accessible information will be dependent on whether the agency decides the costs are worth it or whether the individual needs merit expenditure, therefore potentially discriminating against the interests of minority needs. By contrast, um, my amendment enshrines accessible information in the social security system as a matter of course. In this, it complements my previous Amendment 1C on inclusive communication, which is about supporting individuals to use whatever ways of understanding are best for them. This can only be a good thing. No one has ever complained that a public system was too easy to understand or engage with. Inclusive communication and accessible information are crucial elements in building a system based on dignity and respect for all those who use it. I urge colleagues to support my amendment. Thank you very much. Can I call on Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 22 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Whenever one applies uh, for a benefit, it, it can be, as we've already heard uh, from Ruth McGuire, a, a difficult procedure. Often reforms, however simple we make them, people require advice and assistance to do that. And I think the amendments um, in uh, my name in this section, uh, again, clarify where the, the committee has been going on a journey. I think it would be fair to say that as we started our stage one, there was within perhaps all of our minds some confusion in regard to what advocacy, which we will come on to later, was and what legal and advice and assistance was. And I think it's been very helpful, and I welcome the government's move in regard to it, that we have now separated the two out, and there's a clear distinction between the two. I think it's very important that an individual has that right, and that that right is independent of Scottish Government. And I think we are very fortunate here in Scotland that um, across the country there are many groups, whether within local authorities or third sector, which are providing that advice and assistance which is independent to claimants. Clearly, this has to happen through the whole process, from when somebody goes to find out whether they're entitled to a claim all the way through to if they have to, to go to a first tier uh, tribunal. And I'm grateful again for the Minister in uh, just clarifying the, her support uh, for these. Just to confirm also, President Officer, that in regard to the other amendments within this group, uh, we will be supporting them as well. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister, I call on the minister Jean Freeman, to speak to Amendment 36 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to <coughs> excuse me, Ms McNeill and Ms Maguire and Mr Balfour uh, for providing amendments which I believe strengthen this section of the bill. I'm pleased to support them all. Uh, they are about ensuring that people get all the assistance that they should through the Scottish Social Security system. Uh, these amendments uh, that are not in my name in this group do link to Section 1B, which places Scottish ministers under a duty to promote take-up of assistance and in that way are linked to my amendments 36 and 38. What those amendments do is build on the duty to promote take-up of assistance by requiring the government to publish and periodically revise a strategy for promoting the take-up of assistance. This strategy, which will be produced through a process of consultation, will set out the government's best estimate of the extent to which people are getting the assistance they should be getting and what steps the government will be taking proactively to boost take-up rates over the strategy's lifetime. 
taken as a package, the amendments in this group, together with the provisions already in the bill, will enshrine in law this government's commitment to ensuring that everyone gets the assistance they are entitled to through our social security system and will provide a mechanism for scrutinising the efforts of this and future governments towards achieving that goal. Thank you, I call on Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As members will know, my party is not represented on the uh, Social Security Committee, but I'm very grateful to the Minister and for opposition members and stakeholder groups for keeping us abreast of this. This uh, group of amendments is very important to my party in terms of improving uptake. We know from Scottish Government statistics that as many as 500,000 families in Scotland are not getting the benefits to which they are entitled. So we heartily support all members' in, uh, amendments in this group. Thank you. And I call on Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I, I'm proud of what um, we've all achieved in this group and in this section in, in the Bill. I'm pleased that it builds on one of the key and long-running agreements that we've had with the Government that the system should maximise people's incomes as much as possible. In 2016, we secured the, from the Government an agreement that there should be a statutory duty to maximise incomes. And though there has been some disagreement along the way, this now takes its form at, at Section 1B. £2 billion of benefits go unclaimed every year, most of that reserved, and that money could lift families and communities out of poverty and boost local economies. And I know the, the Minister supports that approach. Um, she's written in the, the daily record about how she envisages a Scotland, a Scotland Once approach, and this must extend to take up um, the same intentions to minimise forms and link Best Start Grant take up to council service is an example that the Minister has used. Paul McNeill secured agreement at stage two to have a, a system which would, le would lead to the automation of benefits or the, the bonfire of benefit forms as it was put. And that progress is, is very welcome. Um, amendments one and 11 have the government support and I'll ple I'm pleased that they will be in the legislation. Equally, I'm pleased to support Ruth Maguire's amendments 20 and 21 which takes my section 1D and ensures that everyone using the agency gets the information, the letters, the advice and records that they need in the most inclusive and suitable form that fits their needs. We do have some concerns with the government amendments 36 through to um, 39. Um, my amendments at stage two set wide ranging requirements on the, the government to make its duty to promote take up uh, a reality and record progress and detailed areas where more work um, is needed and we had the government support at the time. Target-based, um, that, strategy, that strategy to boost take-up requires uh, the government to come forward with measurable outcomes for which statistics should be released regularly. And I was disappointed to see that the minister wishes to remove um, these provisions that I have to say we had discussions and I agreed with the Minister on some changes that, that should have been made because of the potential impact on the, the, the fiscal framework, but I still felt that those targets should remain in place. And in Northern Ireland, targets are being shown to work where they are boosting the incomes of those targeted by £65 per week. And I think it would have been more helpful to see those, that part of the amendments that were passed at stage two, staying within the legislation to see um, real progress and, and targets uh, and progress made against those targets um, to boost the incomes of low-income families in Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on Paul McNeill to uh, wind up on this group of amendments. Um, just amending up, Presiding Officer, I, I think this is going to be a very important aspect of, of the bill in terms of the practicalities of running the agency, and I think it will genuinely help people uh, uptake their benefits um, when, when the agency is finally set up, and I'm happy to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, the first question is that Amendment 1, sorry, yes, Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Ruth Maguire. With regard to confirm she's moving. Moved. Yep. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 21 in the name of Ruth McGuire. Ruth McGuire to move or not move? Thank you again. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Can I call Amendment 22 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated? Jeremy to move or not move? Move. 
Moved. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, Jean Freeman, already debated with Amendment 19. Minister, to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister. Minister, to move formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister, already debated, or group, sorry. Beg your pardon, we'll move on to group four here. Ahead of herself. So, I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister, and this is grouped with Amendments 31, 32, 34, 35 and 94. Minister to move Amendment 29 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 29 and the others in this group make further provision in relation to independent advocacy services. I'm delighted to say that Amendment 31 widens the definition of the group of people who will have a right to access independent advocacy services. Expanding and improving my Stage 2 amendment, I'm pleased to say that these new amendments will ensure that these services can be accessed by people who, because of a disability, require an advocate's help to engage effectively with the system. Amendments 29, 32 and 34 are simply adjustments to make Amendment 31 work. Since the end of Stage 2, my officials and I have been working with stakeholders and MSPs to ensure we have the right definition for this additional support. The amendments that we are debating today have the support of a range of organisations, including Disability Agenda Scotland, Inclusion Scotland, the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability, Citizens Advice Scotland, Camp Hill Scotland and the Scottish Refugee Council. I'm grateful to all of the representatives of these and other organisations who have worked with us to develop and agree these amendments. But in providing for this advocacy support, we as a government must ensure that it is available across Scotland and that a person can be assured of an equity of standards and service, whether you are in Dumfries or Dundee, Lerwick or Lossiemouth. A report published last year by the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance is clear that in relation to advocacy services across Scotland, provision for people with physical disabilities is patchy and was identified as a gap in many areas, as was provision for people with issues relating to benefits and changes to social security. The Scottish Commission for Learning Disability have told me of similar concerns, that there are insufficient advocacy providers, that it is difficult to recruit advocates in remote areas, and that a dispersed population makes for difficulties with service provision. We have to make sure that changes. So I've lodged Amendment 35, which provides for advocacy service standards. This will ensure that those entering into agreements with ministers to provide independent advocacy services for those people we are ensuring have a right to them will provide that consistency of service standards. This approach, central funding and agreements based on mutually agreed standards is exactly the same as we would expect of other services we provide funding for, services such as the national standards for information and advice providers, which are used in the money and debt advice sector. In developing these standards, we will make use of existing models, such as SIAA's Advocacy Code of Practice and their Independent Advocacy Evaluation Framework, because it would be foolish not to. And we will do what we always do, which is to develop the standards in consultation with relevant organisations and, importantly, with the people who currently access advocacy services. We want to ensure that we meet the expectations people will have in exercising this new right. 
the Social Security Bill has within it, I believe, many important and exciting innovations. Enshrining in law the right to independent advocacy services, as we set out in these amendments, is one of them. And so too is ensuring that the regulations that will govern the standards will be approved by this Parliament. Instead of introducing service level agreements across the country, we want the service standards to be agreed by this Parliament. That is why Amendment 94 specifically inserts a reference to the new section on advocacy service standards into Section 55, which governs the regulation-making powers in the Bill to ensure that regulations to set out the advocacy service standards will be subject to the affirmative procedure and will therefore be scrutinised by this Parliament. I hope members will agree that these amendments represent significant progress in the area of Social Security and provide a significant package of support for people who would otherwise struggle to access the support they need and the entitlement that is their right. I move Amendment 29. Thank you very much. I've got a number of members who wish to speak in this section. Uh, Ruth McGuire to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A great deal of skill, knowledge and sensitivity is required to provide quality independent advocacy support to people. We've got a range of high quality services operating in Scotland, not least AIMS in Stevenson in my constituency. But with the substantial additional requirements and investment in line with our new social security system, it's crucial that we ensure these high levels of service are maintained. The Scottish Commission on Learning Disabilities are currently carrying out a scoping study into advocacy services, which highlights the need for consistent standards of services right across Scotland to ensure everyone, no matter where they live, can access the same standard of advocacy services. This is backed by similar evidence from Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance's map of advocacy across Scotland, which highlights lack of consistency in some services. Introducing advocacy service standards will ensure equity of standards and service for all people in Scotland. I support the fact that these standards will be produced in consultation with the sector and those who rely on the services, and crucially, that they'll be scrutinised by Parliament under the affirmative procedure. I support the amendment. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Mark Griffin. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Minister's uh, remarks and the movement the Government has made over the last number of weeks in regard to this. I think the definition of disability or of being disabled is a much better and stronger definition than was uh, agreed at stage two by the Committee. I think we now have to work uh, as a Parliament and as a Government in regard to when the regulations are drawn up to make sure that we understand what we mean by that definition and I think there is work um, out there to be done with advocacy groups, with disability groups um, and with others within the third sector. But I think this definition um, allows uh, the Parliament to know that advocacy will go to those that need it and that is the key thing. Not everybody needs an advocate when we go through this process and to simply open it up uh, to everyone I think would uh, disadvantage uh, those that need it and would put extra pressure financially on the Scottish Government and actually on advocacy groups. I do think there is a challenge of how we will deliver this in time for when these regulations are up and running in different areas. Because there is, um, as I've spoken to different groups um, and as the Minister has said, quite a, a different picture in, wh in where you go in Scotland. Um, we are very fortunate here uh, with the Malovians that there are many good groups who are already up and run, running and will be able to provide this service. But having talked to other groups in other parts of the country, that will be a challenge and we need to make sure that they do have the appropriate resources and training to do it. I think it is also very important to read um, these amendments also uh, with something that was approved previously that an individual will have a right to have somebody of their choice all the way through the process, which is different from what is happening at the moment. And I think that is a very positive step forward by Scottish Government. And I think it also means that often an advocate will not be required because the individual will have somebody there that they know already who can be that advocate and that support. I think it would be fair to say 
that it is Amendment 35 that is perhaps the most controversial one uh, within this grouping. And we will be supporting the government on this um, this afternoon because I think we do need to have a standard that can be applied across the whole of the country. There is a danger that in parts of the country where perhaps there are not good advocacy services, that you end up with individuals simply uh, jumping up saying, I could be an advocate, can I have money please? And that would be the wrong way forward. We need to be able to meet the right standards. We need to be able to give the appropriate service to those that require it. I do very much welcome again the, the Minister's remarks that she's made, made this afternoon that she will consult with the, with the groups already doing it and with those that are interested in it as these regulations are drawn up. And again, I think ultimately it will be a decision for this Parliament as to whether we approve or not approve these regulations. And I suspect this may be a common theme as we go through this afternoon into this early, this early evening. This is simply the start of the journey. Uh, we do not finish uh, today by simply passing this into an act. The regulations are going to be key for individuals. And this area is something um, my group, my party, would be very happy to work with the government on to make sure that we get them right for each individual across this country. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Mark Griffin to be followed by George Adam. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, I want to congratulate the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance and the, the third sector for getting this right to advocacy into the bill. Um, in terms of social security across the UK, they should be uh, proud that uh, their, because of their work, there will now be a right to advocacy in, in legislation. Um, that is a measure um, which does make this legislation in, in itself groundbreaking, um, I feel. And key to Scottish Labour's approach to the Social Security Bill has been a clear desire to ensure that a right to independent advocacy is, is, is included in the legislation. In our submission to the Stage 1 consultation of the Bill, we agreed a uh, provision was needed and we said even if there are fewer face-to-face -face assessments and the private sector is removed from the system, we recognise that independent advocacy is vital to ensure the system is responsive, responsive to the needs of disabled people. And that support, along with the voices of voluntary and advocacy organisations, significantly shifted the, the government's position on um, the right to advocacy. Um, when Jeremy, Mal Jeremy Balfour had his amendment that he, he chose not to move it at stage two, I think this, the committee still made clear um, that aside that the Scottish Government's proposal to limit to mental health conditions um, was a starting point and not the end point in what we expected to, to see in the legislation. The Minister's new amendment states that those with a disability will be able to access independent advocacy and as that will cover those who have the most significant needs and will apply to the agency under the most complex processes flowing from the bill and, and meets their test from the stage one submission, we support the, the government wholeheartedly. We have heard um, concerns though that Amendment 35 puts the independence of advocacy organisations at risk and could set a precedent for Scottish Government influence over third sector providers. Um, advocacy organisations already have a code of practice and they have real concerns that uh, an independent organisation outside of government who would advise um, applicants or perhaps people who were appealing against decisions of an arm of government should be wholly independent and wouldn't like to see service standards being set by that government. They would rather see independent um, standards being set for, for those organisations and it's for that reason, uh, for those reasons we will not be supporting um, Amendment 35. Thank you. Thank you. I call on George Adam to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. As always, I'll take this on as a, in a practical manner because I'm a very practical individual. And when you look at this whole idea, I, I take on board what uh, Jeremy Balfour already said that he believes, and excuse me if I'm paraphrasing you, that 
there could be a case where people could just set themselves up as an advocate in any high street anywhere across the country if there wasn't any kind of standards there as well. And that is a concern because of the quality of the actual advocacy they get. But with practicality I've got, and it's just a question directly to the Minister, isn't the case that Amendment 35 is standard practice currently anyway? Because the Scottish Government already produces guidance for commissioners of independent advocacy, which includes a set of principles and standards developed by the SIAA uh, that the commissioners are used to ensure that the organisation individuals they commission provide independent advocacy services. And I think at this point when we're actually looking at providing a better service and providing more money into uh, advocacy, uh, why, not, why would we, anyone not want to ensure that they had that standard across Scotland, that that standard was available throughout the country? The standard to protect people uh, and also protect those organisations providing a good standard of service for people. And I think that's one of the most important things as well. Because let's not get into a stage where people's professionalism is possibly uh, kind of doubted because uh, there may have been other people saying they're advocates when they haven't been. So I think this is very important to have this here. And I would ask the uh, Minister you could answer these questions. Thank you. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Given that in the passage of this Act we are talking about some of the most vulnerable people in our society, sometimes existing on the edges of our society, many of whom may have complex communication difficulties, that the provision of an advocate to help navigate through the landscape of the benefit environment and to communicate the views and uh, needs of the people who are applying for those benefits is absolutely vital. So Liberal Democrats are delighted to see provision of advocacy on the uh, surface of the bill. We certainly support the government's amendment 31 in expanding who this, to whom this applies. I think that's a, a very clear and very important improvement. Um, we've, we've come on a bit of a journey in this country in the provision of advocacy since it was first properly defined in law under the terms of the 2003 Mental Health Act. And uh, I was very involved with a range of stakeholders in the passage of the Children's Hearings Act which saw a right to independent advocacy for young people coming before the children's panel. So we've done this before and we've not felt the need to have government-defined standards in its uh, provision. Indeed, advocacy is, by its nature, um, adaptive to the circumstances around it. It changes the needs of people who require it, change from rurality to urban populations. There are a range of different organisations providing it, sometimes on a voluntary basis. It is already well self-regulated. I would say to George Adam in his uh, last remark, his question to the Cabinet Secretary about the fact that the government already provides guidance. Well, it certainly provides guidance. There's a very clear difference between guidance and standards and I think that this takes the reach of government a bridge too far which might actually close off the provision of advocacy to those who need it so the Liberal Democrats will be opposing Amendment 35. Thank you Nicole. Ben McPherson. Thank you presiding officer. I like others very much welcome the right to advocacy within the bill and speak in uh, rise to speak in favour of all the amendments in the group in the name of the minister. I speak particularly to Amendment 35, which I also support for a number of reasons. First of all, in my view, it's important that Amendment 35 is passed in order that we ensure that Parliament, Parliament, MSPs will have the opportunity to scrutinise the regulatory framework proposed by the Scottish Government. I think, why would we not want that opportunity to scrutinise this matter? Uh, particularly in the interests of making sure that there's a consistency of standards applied across the country, that the, the same standards that are delivered by advocacy services to a high quality in my constituency and elsewhere in Scotland are consistently delivered going forward. And the fact that we are putting the right to advocacy on the face of the bill makes the necessity of standardisation and a consistency in professional service uh, of higher importance and higher priority. We need to be able to assure those who use these advocacy services that they are getting a high quality service and a proper service and through consultation with advocates and through consultation with others involved in the sector, I think the, the proposal that those regulations would be brought to Parliament, scrutinised and taken forward is absolutely the right and proper and professional way to go about implementing the right to advocacy and therefore I urge members to support all the amendments in the group and particularly Amendment 35. Thank you very much and can I call on the Minister to wind up in this section. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by um, thanking Mr Balfour for, within the first hour, reminding us quite rightly that even when we pass this legislation, our work is not done. 
there will be indeed a great deal more to do uh, for all of us in drafting all of the regulations that will flow from this bill and the regulations we are discussing here are uh, one of the most important set. There are indeed many groups to thank for getting us to this place. I would though particularly like to single out Inclusion Scotland, Camp Hill Scotland and DAS for the hard work that they have put in to help uh, us uh, refine our position uh, on advocacy support uh, to a much better place than we were at stage two. Let me turn to Amendment 35. There is nothing sinister in this amendment. It is entirely about ensuring consistency of quality and delivery across the country, which is, of course, entirely consistent with a rights-based approach. To Mr Adams' question, yes, he is, of course, right. Uh, we do have uh, guidance for commissioners on independent uh, advocacy, which includes a set of principles and standards that they're required to comply with. And we also have produced financial support to the Scottish Legal Aid Board to manage the accreditation process for the Scottish national standards for information and advice providers. What we are trying to do here is add extra to that. We already have standards for services that we provide across the country to ensure consistency uh, of service and high quality. But I want this parliament to be able to look at the regulations that describe what those standards are, which we will have reached having had that wild consultation, having started on the basis of the professional expertise and experience that already exists in the advocacy world that my colleagues have already referred to, but then ensuring that it is this parliament as it should be that provides the scrutiny to that and approves those regulations when we bring them forward. So I would urge members to support Amendment 35. It is entirely consistent with a rights-based approach that says if you want to provide a service, you need to make sure that every single person in Scotland who's entitled to that service can trust that they will receive the same quality of provision as any other person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Could I call Amendments 30 to 34, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. Minister, to move Amendments 30 to 34. Moved formally. Thank you. Does anyone, anyone object to Amendments 30 to 34 be moved on block? Being uh, so voted on block. No, they don't. Good. Uh, the question is, therefore, that amendments 30 to 34 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call the Minister to move Amendment 35? Moved. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Now, this is the first division of the day, so there's going to be a five-minute suspension while we call members to the chamber. So a five-minute suspension.
Thank you. That's the suspension over. We will now proceed with a division on Amendment 35. So this will be a 30-second vote on Amendment 35. And members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 35 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 90, no 33. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call on the Minister to move amendment 36? Moved. Amendment is moved. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 36 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 90, no 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call on the Minister to move amendment 37? Moved. Amendment is moved. The question is that amendment 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 37 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 97, no 25. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call on the Minister to move amendment 38? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 38 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 97, no 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call on the minister to move amendment 39? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 39 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 39 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes 97, no 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call the Minister to move Amendment 40? Moved. Thank you. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 5. And I call Amendment 41 in the name of Adam Tompkins, grouped with Amendments 42 to 46, 66 and 15. And can I ask Adam Tompkins to move Amendment 41 and to speak to other amendments in the group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, um, the amendments in this group pertain to uh, Section 1J, which is introduced into the Bill at Stage 2, and is a statutory restriction on the involvement of the private sector in assessments for disability assistance. Um, and there was a concern amongst a number of us that the wording of that uh, section as introduced uh, at stage two was drawn so tightly that, would, that it would inadvertently um, uh, prohibit the involvement of certain um, uh, um, medical experts in the involvement of assessments, particularly if they had um, uh, self-employment relationships with the NHS rather than were employed as a matter of uh, employment law under, the, under that technical definition of employment. Now, the um, uh, minister, bef before I, uh, uh, after I lodged um, the amendment 41 in my name, presiding officer, the minister lodged um, amendment uh, 42 in her name. And if she uh, moves that amendment and presses it to a vote, then I will happily withdraw amendment 41 because I think the minister's amendment, or not pre rather not withdraw, but will not press amendment 41 to, to a vote because I think the um, wording of amendment 42 more accurately captures uh, the policy intention that I had uh, in seeking to bring uh, amendment 41 uh, to the uh, chamber. So we will support amendment 42 in the minister's name and indeed we will also support the uh, other amendments in this group. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 42 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group deal with the important issue of assessments. We have an opportunity in this bill to do things differently and to sweep away what is a failed assessments regime from the DWP. I'm pleased to say that now, in not pressing his amendment, I would be happy to support all the amendments in this group, now that Mr. Tompkins is not pressing his. I've always been clear that profit should never play, um, be a motive or play a part in making decisions in assessing people's eligibility for disability or any other kind of assistance. That is why I brought forward an amendment, now section 1J, that says that an individual cannot be made to attend an assessment by someone who is not employed by a public body. Amendment 42 is a technical adjustment to Section 1J to ensure that individuals can be taken on by public bodies as assessors without necessarily having a formal employer-employee relationship. For example, they may indeed be self-employed. Amendment 42, to be clear, in no way allows for a public body to contract with private sector operators to employ assessors as the DWP does. I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for working with us to shape amendments 2 and 15 lodged in his name. It is right that where assessment is deemed necessary, individuals will be assessed by professionals who understand their conditions and the impact of those conditions. So I'm happy to support Mr Griffin's amendments. I'd also like to thank Alison Johnson again for working with us to shape amendments 46 and 66 lodged in her name. I have always been clear that the Scottish Government will reduce face-to-face -face assessments by using existing and relevant information to get decisions right first time. It is important that where an assessment is necessary, the Scottish Government give consideration as to how it can be undertaken to reduce any impact on the individual. I'm therefore very pleased to support Ms Johnson's amendments too, and given that Mr Tompkins is not pressing his, I would urge all members to support the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. I call on Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 2 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. We'll support Alison Johnson's amendment in this group, although we cannot support the, the ministers and would not have supported Mr Tompkins' attempt to weaken the hard-won legal ban on the private sector from delivering assessments. Now, while I can see that the meaning in the Minister's letter, the flexibility she is seeking, we feel would allow uh, gig economy assessors, people on 
uh, zero hours contracts to provide assessments and that's not a, a change that we can support. Amendments 2 and 15 in my name, I'm glad to have worked with the government on those, bringing back the policy intent from stage two and will ensure that the assessors are suitably qualified for the condition that they are uh, assessing. That's supported by SAMH and the original impetus behind the amendment I lodged at stage two was to ensure that those who have a mental health condition are assessed by someone who had suitable professional experience. Just now, 39% of PIP recipients have a psychiatric disorder and all too often the, the assessment experience is poor and has contributed to a lack of trust in the system. And met with a, a lack of understanding and an apparent inability to understand and um, fluctuating conditions and stigmatising attitudes. So I, I ask members to support uh, amendments in, the group, in, in my name and in the name of Alison Johnson. Thank you. And I call Alison Johnson to speak to Amendment 46 and the other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I will be pleased to support Mark Griffin's amendments in this group. Um, and I, too, have concerns regarding the casualisation of labour um, with regard to the, to, the, to the government's amendments. So we will not be supporting those in this group. Um, I would like, however, to thank the Minister and the Government very much for the, the positive, constructive way they have worked with me um, on tabling these amendments. Fundamental changes to assessments for disability benefits are essential to building uh, a new social security system that is really based on the principles of dignity and respect. And it is essential that the current approach to assessments does not continue. These assessments are often highly stressful and in many cases can exacerbate the individual's health condition or disability. And in an alarming number of cases, the subsequent decision is then overturned because of the poor quality of that assessment. So clearly something is very wrong indeed. No wonder then that a survey of several hundred Citizens Advice Scotland clients and advisors showed their, and I quote, highest priority for the Scottish social security system was that the number of unnecessary medical assessments for disability benefits is substantially reduced by making the best use of existing evidence. And members of the social security experience panels made similar comments. And this is what amendment 46 does. If evidence is available through other routes, such as existing evidence from GPs and social care professionals, it's sufficient to, corrob to corroborate what the individual has claimed on their application form, then the Scottish Government won't be able to require them to undergo assessment. This is aimed at significantly reducing the number of assessments, currently standing at around 96% of all PIP applications. And if assessment is required, then Amendment 66 requires ministers to explain to the individual why this is the case, to also take into account options other, other than a face-to-face -face assessment. And if such an assessment is required, it must be within a reasonable distance of the individual's home. No longer should applicants have to travel long distances on public transport that isn't accessible as accessible as it should be. And for the avoidance of doubt, the intention here is absolutely not to stop assessments from being done when they're required to determine entitlement, and nor if the applicant thinks they'll benefit from having one. But where evidence can be obtained in a way that's less intrusive and less stressful, then the new principles of the new system dictate that this must be done. Now, clearly, this amendment is only the beginning of such an approach. It won't have the intended effect on its own. Ministers will need to facilitate information sharing, in particular designing evidence forms issued to GPs, for example, that more clearly relate to the benefit criteria than they do now. And I'm sure the Minister will be aware of how closely so many people, myself and the thousands of PIP and DLA recipients in Scotland, will be watching how this provision is implemented if passed by Parliament today. Um, to close, if we are to found this new system, as the Scottish Government is rightly intending, on the principles of dignity and respect, then protecting applicants from unnecessary assessments that can cause distress is one way to do so. Um, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to Adam Tompkins' remarks about his own amendments on uh, Amendment 41. 
Uh, we had anxieties in the Liberal Democrats about that. I, I understand his points, but I still think it would open the door once again to elements of the private sector coming into this process. I think on balance, 42 gets that right. So we will be backing the government amendment. I hear what my colleagues in the Green and Labour benches are saying on that, but for the Liberal Democrats, that strikes the, the right balance. Um, certainly support Mark Griffin's amendments around quality standards and training um, in the process. I think it's absolutely right that people have confidence in the assessment process and that they, people who are carrying it out are trained to a, to a high enough standard that people can understand and have confidence in that process. I think Alison Johnston's amendments add a, a, a very humane element to this aspect of the bill. I think it, it represents a, an important and well-timed departure from how things have been conducted traditionally by the Department of Work and Pensions in terms of assessment, um, particularly around disability benefits. It is certainly putting the applicant at the heart of the process and in many cases in the driving seat. So to, for that basis, she will be assured of our support for her amendments uh, in that regard. Thank you very much. And can I call on Adam Tompkins to wind up in this section? And therefore, uh, just to clarify, to press or withdraw uh, Amendment 41? Withdraw. Withdraw. We've got to formally... Okay. We have to formally check. Does anyone else... Is everyone happy that Mr Tompkins withdraws Amendment 41? Or no one else wishes to move Amendment 41, I should say? No one does. That's good. Can I call Amendment 42, 43... Sorry, can I call Amendment 42 in the name of the Minister? Minister, to move formally? Move formally. The question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division on Amendment 42. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 42 in the name of the Minister is yes, 96, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call on the Minister to move amendment 43 in her name? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call on the Minister to move amendment 44? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call on the Minister to move Amendment 45 in her name? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I now, call, I now call Amendment 2 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 41. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 46 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated? Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, before I turn to the next uh, section of groupings, um, members may like to know that we're just slightly behind. We're about five minutes uh, behind our time schedule. Uh, I did exercise my power under Rule 9.8.40C to allow that debate and that group to continue and to finish um, in the time needed. So, moving on to Group 6. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendments 4, 5 and 6. And I ask Paul Amendment, Pauline McNeill of Bowcarn to move Amendment 3 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 3 in my name and I speak to Amendment 4, 5 and 6, preparation and approval of Charter. I launched a series of amendments at stage two aimed at making the Charter subject to form a parliamentary approval. 
However, the effect of that would have contradicted the need for a clear and accessible charter. I agreed not to move those amendments at stage two and to work with the Scottish Government to come forward with something uh, which would involve some parliamentary approval. So the, the charter being a critical document um, and various amendments at stage two will also ensure that it will be a more critical aspect of the new social security system with reference to the charter. Amendment four means that the government may not make the charter unless a draft has been laid before parliament with parliamentary approval. And amendment six uh, is uh, clear that if ministers decide to make changes to the charter, then that also must be laid before parliament. I think this is the right way for parliament to be involved in, in the approval of the charter. Presenting officer, I move. Thank you very much. I call on the minister to speak to the amendment in this group. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm grateful to Ms McNeill for uh, working with uh, the work that we've done together uh, to bring these amendments forward, and I'm very pleased to support them. They will cement the Charter's status as a fundamental part of the Scottish approach to Social Security and give this Parliament its rightful place, making future governments accountable for any attempt to alter the nature of that approach. Thank you very much, Minister. Polly McNeill, does Polly McNeill wish to add anything by way of conclusion? Nothing more to add. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 47, 48 and 49, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated, and can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 47 to 49 on block? Moved on block. Does anyone object if I put all these questions at once on block? No one objects. Therefore, the question is that Amendments 47 to 49 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 4 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 3. Polly McNeill, McNeill to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 5 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated? Polly McNeill to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 50? In the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 19. Minister to move formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 6 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated. Polly McNeill to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 51 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. We turn now to Group 7. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Adam Tompkins in a group of its own and Adam Tompkins to speak to and move, sorry, to speak to and move Amendment 52. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The, um, uh, the, this um, bill includes um, a definition of the Scottish social security system. Um, uh, and that definition is important because the principles that we've already talked about and the charter that we've just talked about will apply within the scope of the Scottish social security system as defined. Um, and it's been my view since, the, um, the, since this bill was introduced uh, last year that the definition in section seven uh, of the bill of Scottish social security system is deficient, but deficient in just one technical particular. So we know that there are a number of benefits. There are 11 benefits which are devolved in full. Um, and we know that in addition to that, there is the power to top up any reserved benefit. And all of those powers are included within the definition of Scottish social security system as provided for in section seven. But there is also a third element of devolved social security. And that third element of devolved social security is in section 28 of the Scotland Act 2016. And that is the power to create new benefits which don't otherwise fall within the scope of the 11 devolved benefits or the power to top up. And the force of my amendment, amendment 52, which again has been um, drawn up with the assistance of um, the government and the government's lawyers for which I am grateful, is is just to ensure that that additional element of devolved social security is for the purposes of uh, the definition of the Scottish social security system brought within that definition so that uh, the, um, the full definition of Scottish social security system will embrace not only the um, benefits which are devolved in full and the power to create uh, and the power to top up um, uh, reserve benefits but also the power to create new benefits so in that sense it's a technical amendment which I hope will attract the support of the chamber thank you 
Thank you. And I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 52. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to support Mr Tompkins' Amendment 52. It does, as he said, implement his long-standing view that the Bill ought to better reflect the scope of the social security powers devolved to this Parliament. It does so in a way that ensures future schemes to be added to the Scottish system will be introduced through Acts of Parliament with the robust scrutiny that process requires and clarifies that ministers should be held accountable for any future schemes that they choose to introduce. So I'm happy to support the amendment in his name. Thank you very much. Adam Tonkins to wind up. Uh, to press. Yes, please. Move. Thank you. Press, yes, moved. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. That is agreed. I turn now to Group 8 and I call Amendment 7 in the name of Mark Griffin in a group in its own. Mark Griffin to speak to and move Amendment 7. Thank you, President Officer. This amendment was lodged in a previous form at Stage 2 and I'm glad to have worked with the Government to, to bring it back at Stage 3 in a form that we could all support. Um, this amendment seeks to give people a right to cease receipt of assistance at any point and effectively say they no longer wish to receive that assistance. The uh, Child Poverty Action Group highlight that as currently allowed under UK law, it is important that people are able to withdraw their application once they have an award. There are circumstances when a person might want to stop getting a particular benefit, even though they're still entitled to it. For example, this may happen when a person or a couple has a choice between two benefits but only can only get one of them, or a couple has a choice about which of them makes the claim. The Child Poverty Action Group highlight a couple who care for their disabled child. One gets carer's assistance for their child but has their own health condition. They get universal credit. In universal credit, there are extra amounts for someone who gets a carer's benefit and for someone who has a health condition but not both, unless these are different people. If they could not withdraw their claim for the other partner to then claim it, they could be over £150 a month worse off because their universal credit will not include a, a carer's element. So I'm happy to move Amendment 7 in my name. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 7. Thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for drawing this matter to our attention and for bringing forward uh, the proposition that he did and for working with us now to uh, produce this amendment. I believe it is now a practical amendment with a sensible purpose that recognises that an individual should have the choice to stop receiving assistance with a defined process for requesting a cancellation that should also ensure there is no obligation to treat a determination as cancelled if there is any ambiguity in the request. I am pleased to support this amendment. Thank you. And can I ask Mark Griffin to wind up if he wishes to or to press or withdraw? Simply to press the amendment. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group number 9, I call Amendment 53 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 111, 111A, 111B, 148, 113 and 114. Minister, to speak to Amendment 53 and all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As I have said before, the issue we now turn to has been the most challenging issue I've faced in all of the work for this bill. Support for people who are terminally ill is a complex, sensitive and difficult issue. And I'm very aware that behind the decisions we make, there are thousands of people who we must put front and centre of our decisions and our actions. The central principle is that a person who is terminally ill should have the support they need quickly. I have lodged Amendment 148 as an, as an alternative to Amendment 111, which I will not be moving. Amendment 148 has been framed carefully to ensure that the sensitive and difficult conversations between an individual and their clinician, which are required in these difficult circumstances, are held when medically necessary to allow for optimal focus on the patient. I believe that providing for maximum clinical judgment is the best way to achieve that. The amendment sets no arbitrary time frame to the definition of terminal illness, but recognises that it is the skill and expertise of the registered medical practitioner that is needed to determine a terminal diagnosis. 
To support that critical decision making, the amendment allows the Chief Medical Officer, in consultation with registered medical practitioners, to set a framework and guidance. It is this guidance that will decide when an individual has a progressive disease that can reasonably be expected to cause that individual's death. Both the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer, as our national experts, have reviewed and fully support this amendment as the best way to achieve timely support for those with a terminal illness. Amendment 113 creates special rules for terminal illness cases. These guarantee terminally ill people quick access to disability assistance, ensuring that an individual does not have to satisfy a qualifying period in relation to their diagnosis, and that they will not have to undergo further assessments to prove that they have a terminal illness. Their, aw their awards will be calculated at the latest from the date of application, and they will automatically receive the highest rate of financial support to which they are entitled. This is in line with our commitment to, provide, to the principle of providing support when it is needed and it maintains fast tracking for those with terminal illness to remove any barriers to their receiving support as soon as possible. I understand that this will mean Mr McPherson's amendments will automatically fall, but I want to absolutely assure him that my new amendment will cover all people of all ages. Amendments 553 and 114 are minor adjustments needed to make Amendments 148 and 113 work. I call on members to assist those with terminal illness by supporting the amendments in this group, and I move Amendment 53. Thank you. And can I call on Ben McPherson to speak to Amendment 111A and the other amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. The reasons behind why I laid the amendments that I have was to extend the definition of terminal illness to ensure that regulations be framed to include anyone under the age of 18 with a progressive disease that very sadly is likely to cause death. And my amendment sought to make sure that for those young people, special rules would apply so that they got the highest rate of benefit quickly and with no assessment. Doing all that we can to help such young people, those young people and their families is of course very important to us all. And that's why, as the Minister just said, I'm glad that the new Amendment 148 and Amendment 113 in the name of the Minister would enable what my proposed amendments intended to deliver and would account for the policy intention to enable anyone under the age of 18 with a progressive disease likely to cause death to receive the highest rate of benefit quickly and with no assessment. Therefore, given the Minister's new amendments will enable this change based on the balance of views of different parties and guidance based on the input of clinicians, and given that the Minister will not be moving her Amendment 111, I do not move and seek to withdraw Amendments 111A and 111B and instead encourage all MSPs to support the Minister's amendments concerning terminal illness in order to deliver the change that my amendments sought to seek. Thank you very much. I call on Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Mark Griffin. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think, as the Minister has said, this has definitely been the hardest part of the bill uh, for all of us to get right. Uh, it has been a journey that I think we have all been on as a committee um, and as a government. And I think we have ended up in the right place for those who are most vulnerable in our society. The reason that I introduced uh, the two-year stage um, at stage uh, two of the bill was that from my previous experience sitting on tribunals, there were sadly cases that came before the tribunal where someone who had made an application was terminally ill but, didn't live, but, but was going to live beyond the six-month period but sadly died quite quickly after that period, did not get into the special rules, and thus did not receive the money which could have helped them provide better services towards the end of their life. And from my perspective, the six-month rule was simply too short a period of time. And so I do welcome the government's uh, discussion with different groups and with other MSPs on this, and I think to take away the time limit completely actually is the right way forward 
because whatever time you come up with, whether it's six months, one year, two year, five year, it is clearly going to be artificial and clearly some people will get in and some people will not. And I think also, and having been lobbied heavily by my uh, older brother, it is very difficult for GPs sitting in their room to say with any definition or clarity, sadly, you might live for less than six months or two years. And as well as given that diagnosis, they also have to deal with that patient with so many other things that are going on in their life. And clearly it is important that people get the right benefit, but it's only one of the things that a GP or a consultant or a nurse has to deal with the individual. So I think we have made progress. I think we're on the right course. I think the guidance again will be very important and I welcome the Minister's assurances that she will work with uh, the medical officers, with the medical profession, but also with those working in the sector from the fire sector as well. Can I play um, a particular credit to Marie Curie and MND for the work that they have done around this and for the helpful information that they have given. Clearly, no one wants to make this a party political issue. This is what surely as a parliament we come together to do the best that we can. And I think, can I pay respect to the minister for doing that, for trying to take all of us with her, but most importantly, for helping those who have been given a diagnosis that none of us would ever want. Thank you very much. Can I call on Mark Griffin to be followed by Alison Johnson? Thank you, President Officer. We will support all of the amendments that are going to be pressed in this group, and particularly thank the Minister for bringing forward the amendment on uh, special rules and taking forward the policy from the amendment that I had lodged at stage two. And while we were pleased with the changes made at stage two to increase the, the definition of terminal illness to be used to two years, um, the removal of all time limits is a victory for campaigners and those who are terminally ill. Ultimately, the change is very welcome. Uh, that change to essentially move to, a, a, to base a terminal award, award on clinical discretion and the needs of the terminally ill was not expected um, just a matter of months ago. Um, MND and Marie Curie, who have representatives in the gallery um, today, should be particularly proud of the work that they have done to secure um, this change. But I do want to, to sound a, a word of caution that while this change in policy uh, is welcome and that we do have to learn lessons as to how those changes came about and the lessons we need to learn is that processes cannot and that process cannot and should not be a template for how ministers are going to set up the new system. We're expecting swathes of regulation which will include the intricate policy design of nine forms of assistance. And for the campaigners and for the, the people for whom this social security system is meant to be an, invest, an investment, they need the assurances that more detail and policy will be done out in the open well in advance of decision making in the months ahead. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Alison um, Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think um, I entirely agree this is one of the most sensitive and challenging um, issues we've had to discuss, um, certainly during this bill process, if not um, in this Parliament. And I am very pleased with the outcome. Um, I welcome the improvements that have been made through the Minister's amendment, and we will be supporting all amendments in this group. Now, there were many um, MSPs on the committee and organisations involved with the bill, and they've worked hard to find a way to resolve this complex issue. And um, the, the Scottish Greens are very pleased that this new amendment clearly places these sensitive, difficult decisions in the hands of clinical experts. Um, in a previous letter to the Scottish Government, the Chief Medical Officer stressed that decisions about when to fast-track people's benefits should focus on the the health of the individual, not the medical condition or the timescale. 
Um, so I, I think removing that restriction on timescale and allowing medical practitioners to exercise their expert judgment in its fullest capacity is the best way forward for both patients and clinicians. Um, so we very much welcome this change and I too would, would like to um, also express my thanks in particular to Marie Curie and MND whose um, input in this process has been invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure every single member in this chamber would agree that the measure of a civilised society is the compassion with which it treats those given that hardest of news, whether that's in a doctor's surgery or in a hospital. Um, I want to thank the government. On this, I think they have worked the hardest to build consensus, and I know that the work was going on late into the weekend over the wording around this uh, consensus amendment, so I absolutely rise in support of 148 and 113. I think um, I can understand the drivers behind Amendment uh, 111, but we would have uh, stuck with the original stage two iteration of this because we felt it just simply didn't extend enough support. It also put doctors in a very invidious position of having to decide not only at that time of that heartbreaking conversation, but whether that meant that somebody got an award or didn't. Policy around end of life is entirely, uh, is always very, very sensitive. And we owe it to all those people faced with that devastating news that they, we will strip out the party politics of it. So it's right that we put this in the trust of our clinicians, who I know I and everybody in this chamber trust implicitly under the guidance of our CMO. And I'd just like to finish by adding my voice in uh, thanks to MND and Marie Curie, who spelt out in very important personal and visceral detail just what this means to so many uh, people in our country. So I thank the government again for the distance they have travelled on this. And George Adam. Sir, I'm only too aware of being on the committee and for other reasons how complex and sensitive and difficult this issue has been. And I commend the Minister and other colleagues for the fact that we've been able to come to where we are today as well. Because it's a difficult conversation that everyone's had to have uh, during this whole debate on terminal illness. And most members will be aware my wife Stacey has MS. And along with 11,000 uh, others, they're celebrating MS Awareness Week. Now, that's a progressive disease, but you may think the way she's been bullying most of the MSPs today that uh, she's quite healthy and carrying on with things, but it's MS itself, we could be in a position in that uh, time eventually where this could affect us. And that's one of the things that we kind of, I look at all the time when I'm looking at uh, issues like this as well. And I also look at the fact that the constituent I spoke to last week in Paisley, who actually said to me when we're having a discussion about her own individual circumstances and this, this debate and this, uh, uh, these amendments in particular, and her argument was the fact that she was looking to have no timescale because she thought that there, there shouldn't be, the timescale should be up to the clinicians to decide how we go forward. And just in closing, presiding officer, I think we've got ourselves to the right place because it's not for us as politicians to decide an arbitrary uh, figure in time. It's up to the clinicians and giving them the scope and ability to actually be able to make sure. And we have to take into account as well, if someone gets, if we used an arbitrary figure like two years, three years or whatever, you know, an individual will make life-changing decisions when they make, uh, get that uh, uh, actual uh, kind of terminal illness diagnosis as well. So your average clinician is not going to want to put someone in that position. So I think we've got to a very good place I think we've got to a place here now where we've got uh, the public on our side. And just in finishing, presiding officer, I think this, uh, in the real world, in people's lives, this is what we've been dealing with in this issue. And I think that alone has shown that this parliament can come to a level of maturity and deal with an issue like this. Thank you very much. And I call on the minister to wind up in this group. Thank you, presiding officer. I, I will be brief, but there are a couple of things I, I do want to say. I, genuinely appreciate the collective effort and the input from medical professionals, from stakeholders and from my fellow MSPs to find the best approach to terminal illness for our new social security system in Scotland. In all our discussions, people have always given careful consideration to the issues and the complexities involved. I know that we can all agree that the central principle in our approach should be to ensure that those who have to confront all the personal and psychological issues that come with a terminal diagnosis are provided with the support they need when they need it. Medical practitioners will play a vital role in implementing this important change. And I'm grateful to the medical professionals for providing their views 
and for their offer of support in developing the guidance to deliver this new position. I'm also grateful to my fellow MSPs for their very considered approach to this complex issue and for continuing to discuss this with me. It is clear that we all agree on the best way forward and I welcome the cross-party support. I believe we've arrived at the right solution to ensure that people who are already in extremely difficult circumstances are able to access the maximum level of financial support they are entitled to quickly and with the dignity and the respect that they deserve. Thank you very much. And we move to the question, which is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn to Group 10. Can I call Amendment 54 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, Minister, to move Amendment 54 and to speak to all amendments in the group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group will create a right to appeal to the first tier tribunal against a decision to reject an application for assistance or redetermination on the grounds it has not been validly made. Amendments were agreed at stage two, which would require the process for applying for assistance to be put in regulations. The amendments from Mr Griffin explained that his intention with these was to give people a right to appeal against a rejection on an application on grounds of technical invalidity. But in fact, putting the application rules in regulations makes no difference to whether the rejection of an application can be appealed against. My amendments in this group do what the Social Security Committee wanted to do at stage two by creating a right to appeal against the rejection of an application. They also go further and create a right to appeal against the rejection of a redetermination request too. Requiring the application process to be set out in regulations gets in the way of creating an application process that meets the aspirations around accessibility and inclusivity of communication that members have already voted to support this afternoon. I do not believe that anyone thinks that regulations are a good way of getting a public message across. People should not have to get their heads around a lot of legalese, with all respect to my lawyer colleagues, to find out how to apply for assistance. They should be able to pick up a leaflet or go to mygov.scot website and get a straightforward, plain English explanation of how to apply. They should be able to trust that if they follow those instructions, their application will be valid. People should not be tripped up by a rule buried away in the regulations. And if we are to meet the aspirations for the Scottish social security system, which I know are shared across this chamber, in terms of having a system that allows people to make applications in the way that best meets their needs, it does not help to limit the ways which applications can be made to forms specified in reg regulations. I urge my members to support the amendments in this group so that the process for applying for assistance can be made as straightforward and as accessible as possible. And so that, in the event there is a dispute about whether an application or a redetermination request is valid, the dispute can be resolved by appeal to the first tier tribunal. I move Amendment 54. Thank you very much. And I call on Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. We will not be supporting Amendments 54 and 55, but intend to support the rest of the group. Amendment 54 and 55 seek to reverse the effect of my amendments, which the opposition agreed to at committee. These amendments, which mandated that the government must provide in regulation clarity on what a satisfactorily submitted application must look like, were supported by the Child Poverty Action Group at stage two and the, the principle are still supported at stage three. The, the aim was clear, to clarify the process of making an application in relation to whether or not it is validly made. And I believe that these should remain a, a duty on ministers. We're, we're rehearsing this issue again, um, as we did at stage two, but whether the application is validly made should mean simply that the questions on the form are asked in a phone call have all been fully answered. And this is what regulations should say, should say in relation to the manner in which an application must be made. The Minister's Amendments 56 and 58 are welcome and it complements what is now at section 21 in the bill. Making this clear in the bill and regulations will ensure processes are fit for purpose 
and provide certainty for people using the system, not certainty for the government that they can flex the application system as they require. The existing provisions would not require either the bill or regulation to specify exact types of evidence required, a query raised by the DPLR, and will not reduce the ability of the system to be flexible and responsive to the evidence received. In the UK system, before such an appeal right was explicitly provided for in legislation, its absence was ruled incompatible with human rights. And accordingly, President Officer, I'd ask uh, members not to support amendments 54 and 55. Thank you. Does the Minister wish to wind up? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let, let me just repeat. People should be able to trust that the application rules publicly communicated in plain English are the real rules for applying. The idea that regulations saying how applications can be made needn't be complex and over legalistic, legalistic is belied by the evidence. Anyone who doubts that has, needs to look at the UK government's claims and payments regulations. These run to some 122 pages of closely typed text, a very substantial part of which is exclusively about the process for applying for assistance. They have been amended extensively and are fiendish in their complexity. The public, and I suspect many members, are weary of the increasing volume of regulations produced every year. Setting out application forms and regulations was fine a number of decades ago, when there was only ever going to be one paper-based form specified, and putting it in regulations ensured a sort of national distribution. The world has moved on, and legislation should move on too. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed, so we'll move to division. This will be a one-minute vote. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 54 in the name of the Minister is yes, 94, no, 26, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I now call amendment 55 in the name of the Minister, already debated. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 55 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 95, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 56 in the name of the minister. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turn now to group 11. And can I call amendment 57 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with amendments 62 and 70. Mark Griffin to to move Amendment 57 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment uh, 57 in my name. It, amendments in this group uh, were lodged previously in a different format, Stage 2, and I'm glad to 
have worked with the government to bring forward that policy um, in a form that has uh, the government's support. Um, a key call from Paul Gray in his second independent review into personal independence payments was that applicants should have the right to have a clear and thorough notification of why a determination has been made. S specifically, the amendment requires ministers to provide a copy of an assessment report when someone requests it. Um, adding in the, the choice element is a key change since stage two after the minister rightly raised concerns that the automation of this may pass on health information that uh, the applicant was not aware of and perhaps did not want to be aware of. Uh, broadly, the aim is to enhance transparency and subsequent redetermination and appeals processes and ask members to support the amendments in this group in my name. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for working with us uh, on this set of amendments and I'm happy to support all in this group. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Griffin, to wind up or to press or withdraw amendment? Simply to press, President Officer. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we turn now to Group 12. I call Amendment 8 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 9 and 10. Mark Griffin to move Amendment 8 and to speak to all the amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 8 in my name. Again, these amendments in this group were lodged in a previous uh, form at stage two. I'm glad to see that uh, the, the government and I have been able to work together to bring these back again in a form that we can uh, agree. The amendments in this group were, um, uh, sorry, much like um, um, group 11, these amendments seek to ensure that the person with um, a decision has the, the maximum information available to aid their redetermination and appeal, but also if they have an award, how they use it to prove their entitlement or access other passported benefits. Um, the original amendment was lodged uh, with the support of uh, Child Poverty Action Group and sought to ensure that, as standard, a notification is made in writing. And though relatively benign, the Minister rightly pointed out that this could cut across provisions to ensure people had inclusive and accessible communication that we lodged. And as proud as we should be about the challenge we have set for the new agency, that someone should have their preferred communication as default by braille, audio file, email, or indeed in writing, we know that other organisations and companies, in spite of their duties, are not as, as progressive and, um, in accepting these forms. Um, we could never leave anyone in the position that they could not access a passported benefit or be unable, unable to prove their source of income because the organisation refused their preferred method of communication. And I think while there, are clearly, there is clearly more work to do to make these organisations and uh, companies to upgrade and update their practices, we need to have this backstop in the system and ask members to support the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. And can I call the Minister to speak to the amendments in this group? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, once again, I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for working with us on this. These amendments ensure individuals will have a tangible record of why their determination or redetermination has been made without limiting the capacity we have to communicate in the most effective way or to embrace new technologies. And I'm happy to support all the amendments in this group. Thank you. Mark Griffin, to wind up press or withdraw? Press Amendment 8. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 58, 59, 60 and 61, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated, and could I invite the Minister to move the amendments on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask if any member objects to the question on these amendments being put on block? No one does. So the question is that Amendments 58 to 61 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 13. I call Amendment 124 in the name of Jackie Bailey, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and Jackie Bailey to move Amendment 124 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I want to speak to Amendment 124 and all other amendments in this group. Amendments 124 to 131 all relate to the question of appeals to the first tier tribunal. 
Amendment 132 from my colleague Pauline McNeill is about the collection of statistics that will inform future policy about access to appeals tribunals, and I would urge support for that amendment. Presiding officer, a variation of amendments 124 to 131 were for, first brought forward at stage two by my colleague Pauline McNeill. And whilst the Scottish Government did not agree with them at the time, they sought to improve appeals to tribunals. The Government's amendments are to be welcomed, but there still remains an issue of concern. And these have been highlighted by Enable, the Child Poverty Action Group, Disability Inclusion Scotland, Disability Agenda for Scotland, and the Scottish Campaign on Welfare Reform. I apologise if I've missed anybody out of that rather lengthy list. But let me turn to the substance of these amendments. This two-stage access to an appeal tribunal was first introduced by the Conservative government in 2013. Since then, there's been an 83% reduction in appeals. And much as we might like to think that that was because they got the claims right first time, this is unfortunately not the case. According to Enable, around 86% of cases that undergo mandatory reconsideration don't change. 72% of those who had the right to appeal didn't appeal. But when they did, 60% of those who did were successful. If you take those figures together, that means that as many as 20,000 people across Scotland are missing out. I think this establishes that there is a barrier faced by people appealing to tribunals. And if you need to be convinced even further, then let me point to the evidence um, from the government's own social security experience panels. These are the voices, presiding officer, of lived experience, and here are some of their comments. A number of people unable to appeal due to the stress associated with the process and therefore accepted what they felt was an unfair or inaccurate decision. Another comment, I know their decision is wrong, but I don't have the time or energy to fight this further. And again, suffering with depression and anxiety and being made to jump through hoops made me a hundred times worse. So they didn't appeal. The report from the experience panels containing these views was published after stage two, so members didn't have a chance to consider this before voting on amendments. But they are clear. There are barriers to the system which have not been addressed. The amendments before you today attempt to address those barriers. As it stands, someone who's had their case rejected twice by the agency must actively appeal to the independent tribunal service. It is that requirement to appeal twice that is actually the problem. These amendments make the process of challenging decisions smoother, but reflect the minister's desire, which is right, for a rights-based system where the claimant is in control. The agency has the opportunity to review decisions, but where a redetermination comes back with no change, an automatic appeal to the tribunal is triggered. That removes barriers to appeal with the option to withdraw at any point. Finally, I am aware that the Scottish Government is not comfortable with these amendments. I am disappointed, but I would, of course, being a reasonable person, be prepared to consider withdrawal if Amendment 132 in the name of Pauline McNeill is supported because this requires the Government to collect and publish data in this area so indeed we can return to this again, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on Polly McNeill to speak to Amendment 132 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for bringing this matter to stage three of the proceedings because I do think it may well be unfinished business. As Jackie Bailey said, there is evidence that when the mandate redetermination was introduced, tens of thousands of claimants dropped off the system and did not proceed to appeal. Prior to redetermination, of course, a claimant would have had the right to appeal directly to the first year tribunal. And you can understand why people might understand that being a clearer system of appeal. As Jackie Bailey says, confusion, stress, and the vulnerability of any claimants uh, is a concern, I think, for us all, if uh, there may be reasons as to why people drop off after uh, the reconsideration. So we should be concerned about this issue. There is strong support amongst the organisations already mentioned for a one-stage appeal that would mean that if a redetermination 
failed, then the appeal would be automatically sent direct to the tribunal system from the agency. And I will take an intervention from Jeremy Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. I'm grateful. Would um, the member agree that there is a danger that if these amendments were passed, that we would end up with lots of people, cases going to the first tier tribunal, but them never turning up? and thus decisions taking a lot longer to be delivered by the first tier tribunal, and the system being blocked for those that do want to appeal. I appreciate that there was a concern about the bureaucracy of a system that would mean that the appeal would be automatically sent from the agency direct to the tribunal system. Uh, I believe I had designed something that would prevent any confusion. Uh, because the person would be told that their appeal was already in the system. But to be honest, Mr Balfour, I'm still more concerned um, about the number of people who may not proceed to appeal, and I hope you would be too. And I'll get to the question of what, how we might be able to come back to this question. Indeed, in a recent evidence session, and you'll have heard this too, that the organisations who have been in discussion with the Scottish Government about this remain unconvinced um, by the redetermination system. And I pressed them hard on, on this question. So there still remains a very serious concern out there. Um, whether the Scottish Government's approach to this, uh, which they say a redetermination will be carried out differently from the DWP system because a, a new official will look at that claim. We don't know whether that approach will actually work. But to all intents and purposes, it's still mandatory. However, my Amendment 132 at least would require the government to contain information in the annual report which they're required to do in any case. And my amendment would mean that the information contained within the annual report would include the volume of appeals and we could look at the data which would allow Parliament to monitor this. In my, in my view, this is the very least that Parliament can accept on this matter because if those concerns uh, are brought to bear, then at least the Parliament has a chance to readdress this in the future. Um, again, I would thank uh, the Minister Jean Freeman for working with me on this very question on Amendment uh, 132. And with that, I move my amendment, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister to speak to the amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I cannot support the amendments in Ms Bailey's name in this group, but, but I am happy to support those from Ms McNeill. I do want to go through my reasons, though, why I can't support Ms Bailey's amendments, because I think it is important to be clear on the record why that is the case. During stage two, we debated the appeals process in detail because no one, least of all me, wants to see anyone losing out on their entitlements because of a complex or confusing system. That's why the amendments I brought forward at stage two, and which were unanimously supported by the committee, address the concerns about potential barriers to appeal, whilst retaining, and this is the critical point, the individual's right to decide for themselves what they wanted to do in their case. So in the bill as it currently stands, the agency is required to help people who decide they want to appeal and to help them every step of the way, to give the individual information about their right to appeal, ask them to fill in and return a form the agency will send them if they do if they do want to appeal, tell them all about what they should expect to happen next and give them information about local organisations that can provide them with independent support. If the individual decides that they do want to appeal, they simply send the form back to the agency and the agency will then send that form and all the materials it used to make its decision onto the tribunal and the tribunal system, of course, takes it from there. So far, so rights-based and so straightforward. The individual retains control of deciding what they want to happen in their own case. Precisely, I have to say, what the experienced panel members who have made comment on this have said they want. So the difficulty I have with Ms Bailey's amendments is that they remove a degree of that control from the individual. They set up an automatic appeal system that only puts the agency in charge and the individual only comes back into play on their own case in a negative way by pulling out of an appeal that has been automatically triggered. Ms Bailey's amendments state that the appeal process is automatically instituted where the redetermination is the same as the first determination. But what does the same mean? Some of the benefits have different levels of financial award within them. 
So is that what same means? But how, more importantly, and why, should it be the agency that decides if it is to be appealed against? That strikes me as fundamentally wrong. And with information, uh, other, with no information other than the agency trigger, the tribunal would start with no information, not least the grounds of appeal, other than the redetermination was the same as the determination. Now, I appreciate the intentions behind Ms Bailey's amendments to remove unnecessary barriers, so we ensure that, there, that where someone disagrees with the agency's decision, they are advised of and supported to challenge that decision through to first tribunal if that is what they want to do. We have worked to, hard to do that and have positively introduced provision to ensure via short-term short assistance that an individual is not financially discouraged from exercising that right to challenge. I'm not complacent about this, and that is why I'm happy to support Ms McNeill's Amendment 132 to monitor and report how the process currently in the bill is working so that we can continuously look to improve. I believe that is the right way and would ask members to support Ms McNeill's amendment, ask Ms Bailey not to press hers, but if she does, ask members to oppose. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would ask Jackie Bailey to wind up in this section and to move or withdraw her amendment. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I know um, that I don't have the support of the SNP or the Tories um, for these amendments, so I do intend to withdraw them. But equally, let me place on the record um, that these amendments were devised having reflected on the stage two debate and have been changed accordingly. The individual retains their right throughout. It simply is the case that we do not make them appeal twice because we know that under the previous legislation set up by the Tories in 2013 with this two appeal stage process, 83% fewer appeals were lodged. That tells you, I think, all you need to know. Can I address very briefly Jeremy Balfour's point? Because if the objective is to get more decisions right first time, and I hope and believe that that will be the case, it does not follow that the first tier tribunal will be swamped with cases or that people wouldn't somehow show up. Presiding officer, 20,000 people in Scotland could be missing out on their correct entitlement because the government remains wedded to a two-stage appeal process. Um, some more cynical than I um, would say that redetermination is the current mandatory consideration, but just by another name. And whilst I welcome the improvements by the Minister, the barriers remain. Um, I hope that people will support Amendment 132 from Pauline McNeill so that we can collect the evidence to support the changes which, in my view, are still badly needed. Thank you. Thank you. And Jackie Bailey wishes to withdraw Amendment 124. Does anyone object? No one objects. I now call uh, amendment 62 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 57. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 9 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 8. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Call amendment 125 in the name of Jackie Bailey to press withdraw. If not moved. Call amendment 126 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Not moved. I call amendment 10 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Amendment 20, 127, in the name of Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Um, if it would be helpful, presiding officer, I'm happy to not move on block amendments 127 to 131 in the interest of time. Does any other member wish to move any of the motions, the amendments that Jackie Bailey does not wish to move? No one does in that case. Thank you very much. We'll take on 131. Yeah, okay. 163, yes. So we move to calling Amendment 63 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 54. Minister to move. Moved. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 64 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. 
Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 65, already debated? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 66 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 41? Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 67, 68 and 69, all in the name of the Minister, and invite the Minister to move the amendments on block? Moved on block. Thank you very much. Does anyone object if we put a question on these three amendments together? No one objects. The question is that Amendments 67 to 69 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 70 in the name of Mark Griffin? Already debated. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 71 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 14 and I call Amendment 72 in the name of the Minister, grouped with the amendments as shown in this grouping. Minister to move Amendment 72 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, amendment 72 and the others in this group in my name are technical amendments. They clarify that overpayments made as a result of an individual failing to notify a change of circumstances after being told what changes of circumstance to notify may be recoverable. Amendment 80, also in my name, is similarly technical. It provides that payments made in error after a person has died can be recovered from their estate. It is based on the principle that a deceased person cannot have spent the money and equally there is no reason for it to be available to the beneficiaries of the estate. I cannot support Mr Griffin's amendments in this group. The bill as it stands only allows overpayments to be recovered if the error causing the overpayment to be made was either the individual's fault or an error so obvious that the average person would notice it. Mr Griffin's amendments 133, 135 and 136 are, I suspect, intended to change that approach so, uh, though an over, so that an overpayment will only be recoverable if it can be proved that the error causing it would be obvious to the individual who received it. I don't believe the test for recovering an overpayment <coughs> should be subjective in this way or, and would be equitable. People should be treated equally under the law. Why should someone who keeps a close eye on what they are receiving be liable to repay, while someone who doesn't gets to keep public money they should not have been given? In drafting his amendments, Mr Griffin seems to have overlooked the fact that a proportion of people receiving assistance will not be managing their own affairs. They will have a guardian or an appointee acting for them. Mr Griffin's amendments would mean that even very large overpayments that are perfectly obvious to the person managing an individual's affairs could not be recovered because the individual personally could not be expected to have noticed the error. Mr Griffin's Amendment 134, um, in my view, defies common sense. The bill currently provides that an individual can be held liable to repay an obvious overpayment. Agreeing to Amendment 134 would introduce an inherent unfairness to the system. It would mean that an individual wouldn't have to repay an obvious overpayment if the fault lies in determining entitlement, but would if it is a clerical error in, pro in processing a payment. That seems to me a fundamentally wrong approach. Section 36A already makes an overpayment unrecoverable if a mistake in determining entitlement is not reasonably obvious. If a mistake is reasonably obvious, it is unfair that recoverability turns on how the error was made. Finally, I am happy to support Mr Balfour's amendments 146 and 147. I'm grateful to Mr Balfour for bringing them forward in place of his amendment 137, which I cannot support. Mr Balfour is suggesting that all decisions about recovery of overpayments taken by the first tier tribunal and I can, are taken by the first tier tribunal and I can see the sense of it. Of course, transferring a jurisdiction from the Sheriff Courts to the first tier tribunal is not a step to be taken lightly, but the amendment 146 
provide space to consult and refine the approach in light of any issues raised during the consultation. And I'm therefore pleased to support it. I move my Amendment 72. Thank you very much. And I call on Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 133 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. We will support all the amendments in this group. We all promote the ends of having a clearer process of dealing with overpayments in a way that is fair. And though there were changes at 36A, has required considerable change since the bill was lodged. My amendments in this group, 133 to 136, along with Mr Balfour's um, Amendment 137, are submitted with the support and advice of the uh, Child Poverty Action Group. In this group, I'm seeking to ensure a fairer test of liability for recovery of overpayments. There will be occasions when, as a result of agency errors, individuals are overpaid assistance. It's important people have the right to challenge decisions, um, a matter Mr Balfour's amendment covers. The amendments mean that in many cases, people will not have to repay overpayments that were not their fault. In the current bill, the test of liability to repay is still too strict and is stricter than nearly all UK-wide DWP benefit restrictions. These amendments ensure that individuals would only be liable to repay an overpayment resulting from an agency error, where it would be reasonable to expect them as the individual to notice, taking account of, for example, the distress or their own personal circumstances at any given time and not where the error is an error of decision-making by the agency for which the individual has no control. As the bill stands, decision-makers would consider whether a notional, reasonable person would have real realised an error. Instead, my amendments would require decision-makers to assess in a far more person-centred way whether the individual themselves could have expected to notice errors. I think that's more uh, uh, in keeping with the overall aims of this whole process and treating people with fairness, dignity and respect that we treat applicants as individuals that we take into account their personal circumstances at the time that they may have received an overpayment and I would ask members to support all amendments in this group. And I call on Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 137 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, we will be supporting the, the Government's um, amendments, uh, but we will not be supporting Amendments 133 to uh, 136. Um, I'm grateful, too, to the Child Poverty Action Group for the help that uh, they have given on me. And if I can, President Officer, just give uh, a brief explanation of why I am not moving uh, amendment, I will not be moving Amendment 137, but I will be moving Amendments 146 and 147. And uh, the confusion that I think has been caused uh, within some of this is, is due to uh, my, uh, my fault and perhaps my lack of drafting skills at 137 um, and uh, maybe confirms why the legal world was never going to be a career uh, for myself. <laughs> um, what we all want to do here is achieve the right thing. If somebody has uh, an overpayment which the agency has decided that they have, in my view, and I think probably the government's view now, and, and I think also the opposition, uh, other opposition parties, is that that decision should not be decided in the show of court as a, a small claim debt, but should be decided by the first tier tribunal. And then they should make the decision um, which um, would then allow the claimant to know where they are in regard to that and have a right of appeal to the first tier tribunal. Uh, having spoken to um, a number of lawyers, 137 simply does not allow that to happen. If we were to pass 137, the agency would not be bound by the first tier tribunal's decision, and the agency could then again go back to the show of court and take that action. And that seems to give to me two bites of a cherry to the agency, which is not the way forward. What I think 146 and 147, again, if we can get it right after the consultation and get the regulations written correctly, would make very clear that it would not be a debt recovery action in the first tier tribunal, because that wouldn't have that power. It would simply be a decision of whether that claimant has had a valid decision made by the agency, yes or no. 
I think that is a, a much better place to do it than Women's Show of Court. I think it allows those who can give advice and assistance to help people through that. I think although the first year tribunal can be a place that people feel concerned about, it, um, it does a uh, much better place than the Show of Court, which can be uh, very intimidating indeed. So I think we all want the same thing here, and I do believe that if we do support Amendment 146 and 147, um, then we will get there. And I would look your permission, President Officer, to withdraw 137 because I think it will add confusion and not be helpful uh, going forward in regard to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to call now Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Liberal Democrats will support all amendments in, the group, in this group that are pressed forward. We do have some concerns around Amendment 80, around the recovery after death, given the brutal application of some benefit rules that uh, have happened in the past with constituents known to us um, on the death of uh, a, a parent with, with dependent children, and sometimes uh, the application of uh, legislation, no matter how well intended, can have very human consequences. So we'd like to see strong guidance underpinning that as to how that should be uh, recovered. Uh, we'd also support the amendments in the name of Mark Griffin. I think there are some very helpful changes to the language which would make this section far fairer and again add some of that humanity that we've discussed earlier in the debate. And finally, just to lend my support to Jeremy Balfour, um, I too have been very effectively lobbied by the Child Poverty Action Group and make very important points about the fact that we already have a process for uh, appealing the recovery of overpayments uh, through the DWP. We need something similar in Scotland, and I think that 146 and 147 hit the right note. Thank you. Alison Johnson to be followed by Neil Findlay. Um, thank you. I can confirm that the Scottish Greens will support all the amendments in the group with the exception at the moment of Amendment 80, um, and I'll reserve judgment until I hear the Minister's response, because we too share um, the concerns that Alex Cole Hamilton has just raised. Um, Amendment 80 allows Scottish ministers to recover assistance paid after death, and I was struck by the absence of limits on this power. It doesn't specify appropriate periods of time. In particular, it would empower to reclaim even small sums that were paid very soon after death. So can the minister give assurances that this power will be used sparingly with humanity and in particular with regard to people's individual situation? Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Neil Findlay. President officer, I don't particularly want to speak on any of the amendments, uh, or, uh, but I think the issue I want to raise is in relation to these amendments in this group and it's connected to another piece of legislation going through the Parliament. I think it gives the, the Minister the opportunity to address this, and that's the prescriptions bill that's gone through and has come before the Delegated Powers Committee. And it raises the issue of overpayments. It's relating to benefit overpayments and the period that those overpayments remain liable to the person. Um, in England, that period is a period of six years. The prescription bill proposes a period of 20 years, and the Scottish Government don't propose to change that. So in relation to reserved benefits over which the Scottish Government has power over prescription of that, uh, that uh, uh, overpayment and over council tax, will the Minister commit today to look again at the 20-year period of prescription for those overpayments? Thank you. There's a piece of legislation going through the Parliament. It is relevant in this case. Can I ask the Minister to wind up or to press a withdrawal? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, given the scale of, of the payments that we will eventually be making, uh, which will be more in one week than we currently do as a government in a year, it is, of course, entirely possible that mistakes will be made. The government has a duty to be responsible with public money and recover overpayments where it is appropriate to do so. But this must be balanced against fairness to the individual. The bill guarantees, the bill as it currently stands, guarantees that people will be treated fairly because an overpayment can only be recovered if it was caused by the individual's fault or is so obvious a reasonable person would notice it. The government must consider the financial circumstances of the person who owes the money, deciding if and when and how to recover it. An overpayment can only be recovered through deductions from future assistance payments, either with the agreement of the individual 
or if the individual unreasonably withholds agreement at a rate that is fair having regard to the individual's financial circumstances. Mr Griffin would like the bill to say the recipient of an overpayment specifically has to have noticed it and also to make recoverability turn on hair splitting about different kinds of error. I have explained why it would be unfair to have a subjective test for deciding whether a liability exists and that Mr Griffin's amendments would result in public money being unrecoverable in circumstances I do not think the public would either understand or consider fair. At stage two, Mr Balfour and Mr Griffin both suggest that it might be better if debt recovery were pursued through the first tier tribunal rather than the Sheriff Court. This will be already be the case where recovery is sought, sought through deductions from future assistance payments. It is only where ordinary civil recovery processes are being used that a case would go to the Sheriff Court. As I said, I have listened to Mr Balfour uh, and to what he has had to say, and I can see the sense in his argument for having all cases go to the first tier tribunal. There will be work to do in order to ensure that the transfer of jurisdiction in that way is done with full understanding and reflection and consideration, but I'm very happy to support his amendment and to undertake with him and others to work in that way. With respect to Ms Johnson, yes. Griffin. In relation to amendment 146 and 147 that the Minister is, is supporting, can the Minister say for the record if uh, she believes that um, amendments 146 and 147 create a right for individuals to appeal the decision on liability at the point the decision is made under section 36A. Minister. Where, it, where the agency decides that an individual has been overpaid, the agency has done that on the basis of a determination. Such a determination is appealable as we've already discussed in chamber this afternoon when we discuss the process by which an individual can pursue a challenge to the agency's decision. We've, we've had this discussion many times in committee and also in this chamber, and I think the position is clear. In respect to what Ms Johnson asked in terms of uh, the amendment around a recovery from a deceased estate, then we are, of course, um, seeking to have that uh, option in our uh, primary legislation and will then work to produce guidance for the agency uh, and otherwise working with others to ensure that the agency is clear about the balance it needs to strike should it wish to pursue uh, that power that it would have. Um, and with respect to uh, Mr Finlay's question, uh, which I'm afraid caught me and I suspect others unawares, I have little knowledge of what he's talking about. I think it's unfortunate he appears to have little knowledge about what we are talking about today, <laughs> and I am unable to answer him. And the Minister to Press, Amendment 72. Yeah. To Press. The question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amendments? Okay, order please, just order so we can hear the votes. Can I call amendments 73 to 75 in the name of the Minister, all previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move amendments 73 to 75 on block. Moved on block. Does anyone object if I put these questions on block? No one objects. The question therefore is that amendments 73 to 75 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call uh, Amendment 11 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? 11 is moved. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 76, 77, 78 and 79 in the name of the Minister and invite the Minister to move the amendments on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Does anyone object if we put this question on block? No one objects. The question is that amendments 76 to 79 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amendment 133 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 72. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 133 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. And this will be a one minute vote first in the section. Members may cast their votes now on Amendment 133. <coughs> <coughs> 
The result of the vote on amendment number 133 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 31, no, 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 134 in the name of Mark Griffin? Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 134 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 134 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 32, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 135 in the name of Mark Griffin? Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. Let's move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 135 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 32, no, 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 136 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that amendment 136 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 136 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 32, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 137 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 72. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. Mr Griffin. Very well. Amendment 37. So we'll move to a question on 137. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 137 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes, 32, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 80 in the name of the minister already debated? Minister to move. Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amendment 146 in the name of Jeremy Balfour? Jeremy Balfour to move. Or no move. move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 146 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We are agreed. And we turn now to Group 15. Can I call Amendment 81 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 81 and to speak to all the amendments in this group. Uh, presiding officer, I hope the Chamber will be patient with me. This is a quite complex aspect of the Bill. I move Amendment 8. I speak to Amendment 82, 83, 85, 86, 87, 88. These amendments deal with Chapter 5, sections 39 to 42 of the Bill, which set out the offences for benefit fraud. The Bill describes the offences that can be committed by a person providing false or misleading information that leads to an error in the determination of assistance. Consequences are set out regarding the levels of fine and custodial sentences available to the courts. These sections also set out offences when a person causes another person to fail to notify a change in circumstances resulting to a change in benefit entitlement and the same individuals within an organisation can be held responsible. These are vital clauses to ensure that a zero tolerance approach to benefit fraud, but we must make sure that these provisions do what they are actually intended to do and they do not criminalise an honest mistake. And I'd like to set out my concerns here. So the policy intention is not to criminalise genuine errors made by individuals, but the policy note states that the provision is framed to provide that it's sufficient in law that a person knew of the error or ought to have known that it might lead to less assistance. And it is the phrase ought to have known that it might that concerns me. I'm sure we all agree that there is no fairness in a system which allows for the prosecution of those who have made a simple mistake. It was Justice Scotland who highlighted this in a briefing at stage one of the Social Security report. They highlight that the Social Security Administration Act section uh, 111 is the most commonly used in the Scottish courts and it will be immediately appreciated that these, there are significant penalties imposed in relation to a failure to notify changes affecting entitlement under a complex Social Security regulation. For example, the issue of whether a couple are to be regarded as cohabiting is one example of the difficulties which the courts have to resolve. And it's against this backdrop that the courts have interpreted the legislation strictly requiring proof of the criminal standard of all the elements of the offence and in particular that, they have, that the prosecution would require to prove that a claimant knew that a change in circumstances would affect benefit. The UK legislation does not use the phrase ought to have known that it might have led to less assistance and uh, rather it uses the term knowingly. So for cases of alleged fraud for a reserved benefit such as housing benefit claimants will be prosecuted under this UK Act but if it's a devolved benefit such as carers allowance for example it will now be prosecuted under the new Social Security Act but with a different form of words and my concern is about the drafting of those words. We prosecute in the courts day in, day out on the section that I just outlined and, the, and uh, across the UK, £1.9 billion pounds has been recovered in benefit fraud, so it does work. It would have made more sense to me to use the same drafting as the UK legislation for the avoidance of any doubt. So I want to ensure that the new provisions that are drafted differently do not prosecute people for genuine error. Uh, CPAG, Citizen Advice um, Organisation and several others still have concerns about these provisions and the Minister will know that I've spent some long hours over which I'm very grateful to her officials um, in trying to understand the reasoning behind the wording in this Act. The policy memorandum does draw a distinction between the criminal offence of error and the unintended error by an individual. It adds the policy intention is not to criminalise genuine errors and suggests when it is shown that the individual misunderstood an element of the application that it's made a genuine error and prosecution will not follow. So that's good. But according to Justice Scotland, however, Section 39 does not appear to specify that the person actually need know that the statement was misleading, which is not in line with the policy intention. It is overbroad in their view, and if you read the wording, it creates an offence which does not require the criminal intent on the part of the accused criminalising behaviour, rather careless, careless or negligent. Um, section 40 creates an offence of failing to notify, which of course is punishable up to five years in prison, where it states the person knew 
or ought to have known that the change might result in an individual ceasing to be entitled to less assistance. Again, Justice Scotland are concerned that in its present forum, it is overbroad. It has the potential to penalise conduct that has not been in, the circum in these circumstances as they might affect benefits. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I, I think perhaps myself and the Scottish Government are at one about the intention of the section uh, 39 to 42. My concern is in the draftings of these provisions. I just think it would have been clearer to use the same wording as the UK statute. We prosecuted in the courts, day in, day out. Um, I also would like to thank the Minister for a letter that she issued to me on Monday following a conversation I had with her officials uh, and where it helpfully sets out uh, to me the government's intention in this regard um, that with the defence of reasonable excuse um, that it is not the intention to criminalise uh, an honest mistake. I, I would be prepared not to press this but I did need to outline my concerns on the record. If the, mister, if the minister is clear in her summing up that there is no intention in the framings and the drafting of section 39 to 42 to criminalise an honest mistake and that the insertion in stage two of the defence of a reasonable excuse is to be proven in the balance of probabilities. If she can give me uh, those assurances, then I would be happy and content that we're at one about the actual intentions of section 39 to 42. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call on Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. I just want to reiterate the, my concerns with these proposed amendments that were, were stated at stage two in that I would have concerns about the amendments with regard to the burden of proof, uh, what would prosecutors be expected to prove, and how would that evidencing be, un be undertaken? Of course. Colleen McNeill. So this was raised, what would the prosecutor be required to prove if you have to prove that the person knew? What mystifies me about this, this is exactly the language of the UK statute, I refer to section 11A, which says you must show exactly that. But yet we prosecuted in the Scottish courts, day in, day out, and across the UK have recovered £1.9 billion. So why would that not be good enough for the, for the Scotland? Now that, that, that's, that's what mystifies me about it. Ben McPherson. I think I just refer to what was discussed at stage two and that the concept of knowingly in order to evidence that whether false or misleading information had been knowingly given or not is a concept that's legally problematic. Reassurances were granted at stage two the, and uh, I think the, the, the reassurances that were in the, the letter to the minister and I uh, acknowledge Polly McNeill has, has stated that she would uh, not press these amendments if further reassurance was given uh, again by the minister in, in summing up but I, I reiterate my points around the fact that I think the, the concept of being able to prove in the courts around the, 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 whether uh, false or misleading information had been given knowingly or not uh, is legally problematic. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to lend the support of uh, these benches to Pauline uh, McNeill's amendments, I think that uh, a very welcome language shift in here, recognising that genuine mistakes do happen. We shouldn't, if we're building this as a humane, more humane uh, social security system, then we shouldn't penalise people for errors they genuinely make. But if she is satisfied by the assertions of the minister in her summing up, then so too shall these benches. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to speak to the amendments in this group. Thank you, <coughs> Presiding Officer. Um, as has been said, the amendments in this group were rejected at stage two, but they relate to an important issue, so I can understand why Ms McNeill wished to raise them again. Before I put our position on the record and uh, for the record make it clear what is in the bill, uh, I should say that I can give of course, Ms. McNeill, the assurance, uh, and indeed Mr. Cole Hamilton, that it is our shared intent not to criminalise where an individual has made a genuine mistake or has a reasonable excuse. And again, to be clear, the term reasonable is a term widely understood across our courts and justice system. I remain firmly of the view that these amendments from Ms. McNeill are unnecessary. Our policy is clear. We will treat people fairly, with dignity and respect. But we cannot be naive. Social security fraud is a risk, 
and public funds must be protected, not least so they are available to give assistance to those who are generally entitled to it. Section 39 makes it an offence to provide false or misleading information with the intention of obtaining assistance that the recipient is not entitled to. The offence already requires intent. There is no reason to add the word knowingly, as Amendment 81 would do. Section 40 makes it an offence to fail to notify a change of circumstances in breach of a duty to do so if and only if the failure results in someone receiving assistance they should not and the person has no reasonable excuse for the failure to notify. What this means is that if an individual claims to have a reasonable excuse, the legal burden to prove it is not a reasonable excuse falls on the prosecutor. Be but before a case even gets anywhere near a prosecutor, there will of course have been an agency investigation. If a person has a reasonable excuse, they can give it then and explain any other mitigating circumstances. These factors would be taken into account before officials concluded the investigation and where a genuine error had happened, then the matter would rest there. Where there has been a genuine error and it goes to the fiscal service, the fiscal service is unlikely to prosecute because they apply a case marking test that asks whether prosecution would be in the public interest. And even if someone were prosecuted, having a reasonable excuse will mean they are exonerated. Ms McNeill's amendments to section 40 and section 41, which are similar, risk making the offences so difficult to prosecute that nobody would take the risk of prosecution seriously and open up the system to inten intentional fraud. Finally, we come to section 42. This allows a senior figure in an organisation to be convicted of an offence committed by the organisation if the criminality can be attributed to the officials, and I quote, connivance, consent or neglect. Amendment 81 would remove the word, the element of neglect. Section 42 is worded in the usual way for a section of its kind. Examples can be found in many other acts of this parliament. And I have to ask, why should a company director not be held personally responsible if he neglects his duties, turns a blind eye and allows the company to commit social security fraud? I think a director in that situation should have a case to answer and I therefore do not support Amendment 88. All that said, I recognise that a consistent approach must be taken by agency staff in reporting cases for consideration of prosecution. And I'm happy to put on record that detailed guidance and training will be developed for our agency staff. This will complement the code of practice on investigations that the bill already requires. The code will set standards of conduct for investigations and explain how we will ensure during investigations that a person's dignity is respected. It will be consulted on so that Ms McNeill and others can see what it will, be, will provide and will be able to contribute to its development. For the reasons I have given, I cannot support Ms McNeill's amendments to this group. I would invite her not to press them, but if they are pressed, I would urge that they are not agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I ask Pauline McNeill whether, well, to wind up and also to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw Amendment 81? Nothing more to add, presiding officer, except I'll be seeking withdrawal of them when they're moved and not moving the others. Thank you. Ms McNeill wishes to withdraw Amendment 81. Uh, does anyone object? No one objects. And the other is not 81. And Ms McNeill does not wish to move... 81 to 88. Does anyone object? Does anyone wish to move any of these amendments? No. Very good, thank you. I call amendment 89. In the name of the Minister, already debated. Minister to move, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I turn now to group 16. Can I call Amendment 90 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in this particular grouping. Minister, to move Amendment 90 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My amendments 90 and 91 are technical amendments to the uprating provisions in Section 44A. They clarify that the duty to consider the effects of inflation will apply to current rates of assistance, but not to rates that may remain in legislation for events that have happened in the past. 
The Best Start grant is an example here. For a time, there might be both an older and a current rate prescribed in regulations. The older rate applying to births that have happened, but for which an application has not yet been made. The older rate will already have been reviewed and it would serve no purpose to review it again. Amendments 12, 13 and 14 in the name of Ben McPherson would commit the Scottish Government to increasing any relevant figures in the funeral expense assistance regulations to take into account the impact of inflation. At present, this is expected to affect the flat rate element of the payment, which has been capped by the DWP at £700 since 2003. We have already committed to widening eligibility for funeral expense assistance to reach around 2,000 more people per year at an estimated cost of £3 million. Whilst there are significant pressures on the Scottish Government's budget, I recognise that the value of the capped element of the current funeral payment has eroded over time. I will therefore support Mr McPherson's amendments so that current funeral payment has, uh, uh, so that there is no further reduction in the value of this part of the payment to bereaved families. Amendments 139 to 141 in the name of Mr Griven seek to adjust the calculation of the carers allowance supplement to take account of inflation. Carers allowance supplement already provides an increase of 13% in 2018-19 to support for carers, significantly more than inflation. This represents an additional investment of over £30 million per year. I estimate that Mr Griffin's amendments will cost a further £30 million over the next five years, which will need to be found from within the Scottish budget. But I am happy to make that commitment in recognition of the vital role that carers play. I move Amendment 90. Thank you very much. I call on Ben McPherson to speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. When passed, this historic bill will successfully transition and deliver the 11 benefits devolved under the Scotland Act 2016, and that will undoubtedly make a meaningful and important difference all across our country. One of the many important differences this bill will make will be the delivery of funeral expenses assistance. This will re replace the UK government's funeral payment, providing critical financial support to people at a very difficult time. Funeral costs have risen significantly over the last 10 years. This means that individuals and families are more likely to experience a financial shock as a result of having to pay for a funeral, especially where the person who has died has made little or no provision for the cost of that funeral. This can push people into unsustainable debt, which can have a negative impact on the already difficult grieving process and on mental and physical health. Now, the Scottish Government has already undertaken a number of actions working with stakeholders to alleviate funeral costs, and I'm absolutely aware of that, including measures in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan and the Funeral Assistance Plan. And so the delivery of funeral expense assistance under the new social security system has the potential to build on previous progress. And an important way to enhance this would be to uprate funeral expense assistance for inflation going forward. This is, of course, not just my view, but also the view of many others, including Citizens Advice Scotland. Presiding officer, as drafted, the bill currently envisages uprating carers' assistance, disability assistance, and employment injury assistance, all of which I very much welcome. And if passed, amendments 12, 13, and 14 in my name would add funeral expense assistance to that list, making sure that in the years ahead, funeral expense assistance would keep pace with inflation keep up with funeral costs and deliver critical financial support to people at a very difficult time. I believe that amendments 12, 13 and 14 are important. I'm grateful to the Minister for her support and would welcome the support of other MSPs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Mark Griffin to speak to amendment 139 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. We will be supporting all amendments in this group. And we welcome the government's substantial movement on this issue well, it's always been their policy intention to provide uprating to disability assistance. Until Christmas, the position had been that uprating should not be in the legislation. And that is a welcome change, and we want to support that and improve on what the government have offered. At stage two, I amended the government's amendment to afford carers the same protection they enjoy under the UK system. At stage two, I also raised a discrepancy with the carer supplement that the formula at section 47 would mean that ministers will pass on the UK government benefit freeze to carers. 
and amendments 139 to 141. I'm seeking to rectify that. Now, briefly, President Officer, the link to job seekers allowance means that the supplement will be frozen. The Minister would be required to, as part of their uprating processes, determine what the inflated value of the combined supplement and underlying carers allowance should be and so ensure that the higher amount is paid. And as I explained at stage two, without this adjustment, the discrepancy would mean that the Scottish Government would save itself £5 million in 2019-20, while carers would lose out in real terms just a year after that very, very welcome boost, eh, which the Government is to be congratulated for, of 13%. I welcome the Minister's support for these amendments and the, the fact that um, the Scottish Ministers will take full control over carers' allowance to iron out this anomaly when full competence for this benefit is uh, taken on by Government. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Scottish Greens will support all amendments in this group, um, but I would like to put on the record that, that we regret there is no commitment to uprate all benefits in line with relevant costs. Um, this was a, a, a debate that we had and I lost at stage two, but we will continue to ask the government to pay the closest attention to this. We cannot, we simply cannot have a system that suggests it is based on dignity and respect if people don't have enough money to have a reasonable standard of living. And so I really, I really would urge the government to continue to look at this. If living costs increase and benefits are frozen um, as they have been, this will make life incredibly difficult for people. The benefit freeze has taken £300 million pounds out of the pockets of 700,000 of the poorest people in Scotland. And I really do think a social security bill should uprate benefits automatically. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can I ask the Minister to uh, wind up and to press or move, press or withdraw Amendment 90? I wind up formally, presiding officer, and press the amendment. The question is that Amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 91 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 91 be agreed. Are we all agreed to? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 12 in the name of Ben McPherson? Ben McPherson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 13 in the name of Ben McPherson? Ben McPherson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 14 in the name of Ben McPherson? Ben McPherson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. We turn now to Group 17 and can I call Amendment 138 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 142 and 143. Mark Griffin to move Amendment 138 and to speak to all amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 138 in my name. Um, I'm seeking to return to my amendment, um, which would put in place the mechanism to top up child benefit by £5 per week and give effect to the Give Me Five campaign call. Now that follows the announcement before Easter that the government will now pursue the delivery of an income supplement to boost the low incomes of families and lift children out of poverty. That announcement is welcome, if not overdue. But detail will be in short supply um, for over a year. And for the children suffering in poverty now, they will have to wait until 2022. I want to touch on some of the points that I made at stage two, but I think it's clear to the full chamber that there are few options open to the government and that it is only the top up of child benefit that can deliver in the immediate and short term. Last year's Child Poverty Act confirmed this parliament refuses to just turn a blind eye. The time for acting on those sentiments, however, is now. In the face of this transition to universal credit, the benefit freeze, and further austerity, we can and we should set a different path. Inflation may now be falling, but the weight on family weekly budgets is still too much to bear. Only yesterday, the Trussell Trust 
published new data that showed 170,000 people had, a, had to ask for a food parcel last year, showing just how much families are struggling. And with child benefit losing its value for another year, this would assist over 500,000 families struggling from the impact of a Tory government. But more importantly, President Officer, 30,000 children lifted out of poverty instantly. And the IFS predict that by the time of the next Holyrood elections, one in three children will be in poverty. A key to the Give Me Five campaign's work is the recognition of the near universal uptake and eligibility criteria of child benefit, make this the most appealing option to have the most immediate impact. Indeed, the Commission noted in Recommendation 23 that the Government must consider, and I quote, that the greatest financial impact alongside other relevant factors such as cost and complexity of delivery, take-up rates, income security and potential disincentives to move into work or increase earnings in order to identify the most effective option to impact on child poverty. Alongside this, the complexity of topping up the means-tested system, which is going through a period of huge transition, is beyond belief. Now, that alternative, topping up child tax credit, would also require the government to top up universal credit and income support for the medium term. The modelled impacts based on 100% take-ups are of no use when 100% take-up remains an impossibility in the medium term. Now, the complexity, not to mention the risk to any supplement by endorsing the Tories shambolic universal credit system is enormous and the government itself have cautioned against it. And finally, President officer, I heard comments at, at stage two about this amendment cutting across the budget process. And I said then, as I say it again, that I and my colleagues behind me would happily ride roughshod over the Scottish Government's budget if doing so would lift 30,000 children out of poverty, and I would do so every single day of the week. <laughs> Until next year, at least, the parents of 200,000 or so children in poverty have no idea when they will get the support this government now wants to commit. For that reason, I press Amendment 138, the only proposal on the table to lift 30,000 children out of poverty. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Can I call Alex Crawl Hamilton to be followed by Alison Johnson? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Liberal Democrats certainly have a lot of sympathy with the motives behind uh, this group of amendments, but unfortunately cannot support it. Um, we attended many of the stakeholder events around the suggestions for this campaign and certainly agree that universality has its place in terms of the extension of benefits to vulnerable families. But our anxiety is that the taper up to which, up to which the threshold of uh, which child benefit is paid, if that represents a spectrum of need, then we would far rather see that money concentrated at the, the sharper end of that taper. So uh, we think there are better ways of doing that, um, considering the number of very affluent families that would receive such a benefit, and as such, with regret, cannot support this group of amendments. Alison Jones. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the, the Scottish Government supports the principle of universality when it comes to higher education. I welcome that. They support this principle when it comes to prescriptions. I welcome that. I cannot think of a more important area in which to support that principle than making sure that children in Scotland have enough money. This Parliament is committed wholly to closing the attainment gap. Children who are you know, going to school, who've maybe not had the best breakfast, who families are struggling to heat their homes, they cannot attain to the level at which they might expect to. I think this is a very, very important amendment and one that I wholeheartedly support, as do the Scottish Greens. Um, the Child Poverty Action Group tell us that, that in 1989 it was realised that child benefit was worth less than it had been in 1950s, and John Major's government chose to slowly restore its value. Uh, and that process went on. Progress was made. But this benefit has been decreasing in value consistently since 2010. It's not worth what it was. Um, all we're looking for here, I think, is a very sensible measure to restore some of that value. I wholeheartedly support the Give Me Five campaign. I wholeheartedly support that amendment. And I would ask colleagues across the chamber to do so too. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call on the Minister to speak to the amendment in this group? 
Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 28th of March this year, the Scottish Government's Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan was published. It sets out a clear commitment for a new income supplement for low-income families to tackle child poverty. Of course, I recognise, recognise the rationale behind proposals to top up child benefit by £5 a week, but to deliver it would cost at least £200 million every year, and yet only £3 out of every £10 would go to low-income households. What's more, the top-up would have more limited effects on lifting families out of poverty than other options set out in the Poverty and Inequality Commission advice, which we asked them for. That is why I urge members to oppose these amendments today. We want to effectively target children who are living in poverty, and we will look at all measures to do so. But the proposals to top up child benefit do not do that. The Institute for Public Policy Research conducted modelling earlier this year, and its clear conclusions reflected in the Poverty and Inequality Commission advice where the increasing child benefit is not the most effective way of reducing child poverty. The Commission also rightly gave their expert inde independent advice that we should not only consider the most effective use of resource, but we should also give careful consideration to deliverability and to being able to get the money to those who needed it as quickly as possible. So it is a false premise, if I can just finish this point, it is a false premise to put before this chamber that passing this amendment will instantly see a £5 top-up because the, the whole question of deliverability within our social security powers, as Mr Griffin and his colleagues well know, is part of a planned, very careful and inf incremental programme to ensure the safe and secure transfer of benefits for £1.4 million. And Mr Griffin may be happy to say that he would ride roughshod over the Scottish Government's budget process. Actually, he would be riding roughshod over this Parliament's budget process, and that is not something that I would countenance. So our income supplement will demonstrate our commitment to reducing child poverty and that funds are used to best effect to reach those families most in need. I urge members to oppose these amendments today. And can I call on Mark Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 138? Thank you, President Officer. The, the point has been made repeatedly by members who, who oppose this method that there are better ways to spend this money. W what are these better ways? Where are they? Where is the amendment that is going to lift children out of child poverty in this bill today that stands up against a £5 uplift in child benefit? That the, the arguments against this policy are that it is universal and not all money goes towards uh, families in poverty. Well, I don't receive any child benefit for any of my children. No member in here receives any child benefit for their children. It's not completely uh, universal, but we don't um, hear any arguments against universality, as Alison Johnson pointed out when we talk about tuition fees, when we talk about prescription charges, and so this amendment should, would be something I would expect the government would be able to wholeheartedly get behind, given their previous support for universal benefits. The, the minister has also raised the, income, the, the, the low income supplement, and I will welcome the debate around the policy choices when it comes. There may be an option that the minister puts on the table in two, three, four years' time. But the option on the table right now is to increase child benefit by five pounds. No other option. That option will lift 30,000 kids out of poverty right now. I ask members to support that amendment. Thank you. We move to the question on amendment 138. The question is that amendment 138 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and the members may cast their votes now. And this is a one-minute vote.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 138 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 26, no, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 139 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 140 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Move. That's moved. The question is that Amendment 140 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed to. I call Amendment 141 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? That is moved. The question is that Amendment 141 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 142 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mark Griffin, to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members be cast the votes now. This is a 32nd division. The result of the vote on amendment number 142 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 26, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 143 in the name of Mark Griffin? Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote in amendment number 143 in the name of Mark Griffin is yes, 26, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I turn now to group 18 and I call amendment 92 in the name of the minister, grouped with the amendments as shown in this grouping. Minister, to move amendment 92 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, presiding officer. The amendments in this group are about housing assistance. Section 48D already provides for regulations to be made allowing councils to deliver housing assistance. Amendments 92 and 93 in my name would extend that power, allowing councils to also deliver short-term assistance where it is to be given as a run-on of housing assistance. Amendments 119 to 122 are a response to the announcement by the DWP that they have abandoned their policy of denying support for housing costs to some 18 to 21 year olds receiving universal credit. The DWP may well have dropped that policy because it has failed to realize significant savings, but I nonetheless cautiously welcome this U-turn. Amendments 119 to 122 alter schedule eight so that ministers are not obliged to make housing assistance regulations to mitigate the effects of abandoned DWP policies. The amendments cover the U-turn on 18 to 21 year olds and also future proof the bill for the day, if that ever comes, that a UK government drops either or both their bedroom tax and benefit cap policies. To be clear though, the amendments only remove the duty on the Scottish Government to provide housing assistance to mitigate those DW policies if and for so long as the DWP is not pursuing them. I can assure members that the existing mitigation scheme for 18 to 21 year olds will remain in place for as long as it is required. It is regrettable that the Scottish Government and local authorities have invested both time and funds over the last year in mitigating a policy which was always both unfair and unworkable. 
I wish the UK government had listened to the sense we spoke at the time and this inconvenience and waste could have been avoided. I move Amendment 92. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And there are no other members wishing to speak in this particular section, so I think we'll just go straight to the vote. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 93 the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 93 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 132 in the name of Pauline McNeill, debated earlier with Amendment 124. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 132 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turn now to Group 19. And I call Amendment 144 in the name of Mark Griffin, in a group on its own. Mark Griffin to move and speak to Amendment 144. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 144. Um, that amendment seeks to place in law a requirement on ministers to bring forward regulations under Section 30 of the Scotland Act, which ensure that payments of universal credit are automatically split between both members of a couple, allowing an opt-out should a couple wish to retain a joint payment. I'm pleased that this amendment has, just, has achieved a, a broad coalition of support from organisations including the SCVO, one Parent Family Scotland, Advocar, Poverty, Poverty Alliance, Scottish Women's Aid and Gender and the National Association of Welfare Rights Advisors. The amendment transposes the restrictions included in the Scotland Act and requires the regulation to follow a set policy objective to automatically split the payment. Though split payments can be requested under the current system, they are massively underused and underpublicised. Now the focus of the Work and Pension Select Committee, split payments are getting the attention they deserved. Last, last month, the EH, EHRA, EHRC released research that universal credit single household payments to couples had contributed to a drastic shift in income from women to men as a result of the introduction of universal credit. As I indicated at stage two, the policy would follow that proposed by the Minister's colleague, Philippa Whitford. At Westminster, Ms Whitford is pursuing a Member's Bill to automatically split payments, but was just last week told that this is not supported by a callous Tory, Tory government intent on maintaining the single payment mechanism within universal credit, a system criticised by the United Nations. In the consultation on social security, there was overwhelming support for universal credit to be split between the members of a household from 99% of organisations and 78% of individuals. 74% believe payments should be split automatically. That would aid gender equality in the Scottish social security system by promoting financial autonomy and help to protect women and children from financial and domestic abuse. And as, as much as I would want it to, this amendment doesn't require ministers to rush to establish a split payment scheme and removes the timescale included at stage two. The amendment rightly requires the minister to continue her consultation with the DWP. That is, it, is in itself a requirement of the power in the Scotland Act. In recent question responses, the minister said a year after the cabinet secretary first promised progress in this area, that officials that are discussing with the Department for Work and Pension the feasibility, operational and cost impl implications of these different policy options. And to date, we have not been told of the progress of these meetings and discussions, and I would appreciate it if the Minister can say when they started and what stage they are at, since clearly the DWP officials that we had the, at the Social Security Committee, unfortunately, were not able to. I am, however, thankful to the Minister's discussions with me on the matter of split payments. Um, I'm content that she too wants to see split payments uh, delivered. And the precise commitment on whether she wants a choice to split or automatically help uh, women and their children. And uh, I hope that she can give uh, the support today by supporting Amendment 144. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Ruth Maguire to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I support the introduction of automatic split payments. The situation that we have at the moment with a joint payment unless otherwise specified is problematic on two levels. Returning to a single male breadwinner, mod breadwinner model is damaging and regressive in general, but it's particularly dangerous in the context of domestic abuse, where fi financial coercion is often used as a tool by perpetrators. 85% of domestic abuse survivors who spoke to the charity Women's Aid said that the act of applying for split payments could anger their partner and make the abuse worse. Scottish Government is in ongoing discussions with the DWP on how it can introduce automatic split payments in a way that's both technically feasible within the IT systems and financially viable and justifiable for the Scottish taxpayer. This is clearly a complex and time-consuming task. At last week's Social Security Committee meeting, a DWP representative, in answer to Mark Griffin, reiterated the complexity of the issue and stated that there's no timetable for when an agreement might be reached. This delay and complexity could of course be avoided if the UK government could be pressured into fixing the issue at source. There is also another far more important reason for calling on the UK government to fix this issue at source, and that is that domestic abuse doesn't stop at the border. This is an issue for all women, and the best outcome is not the Scottish government negotiating an exception from the rest of the UK, but one where the UK government fixes the problem at source for the whole of the UK. For both these reasons, for the complexity of negotiating an exception and the importance of this issue to women across the UK, I would urge Mark Griffin and his colleagues to redouble their efforts on pressuring their UK colleagues to call on the UK government to fix this issue at source. And they can, of course, do this not least by supporting the private members' bill published last month by my Ayrshire colleague, Philippa Whitford MP, which calls on the UK government to make split payments default. That would be the best outcome for women across the UK. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Pre Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful, uh, as are these benches, for Mark Griffin bringing this very important amendment forward. Um, I served for three years on the Ministerial Task Force on Violence Against Women, and uh, I'm absolutely committed to this as a policy shift because financial dependence is used as a, coercive, a tool of coercive control in abusive relationships, and this is a very, very important step to uh, eroding that dominance that uh, men who abuse their partners uh, can have. So absolutely grateful to Mark Griffin for bringing this forward and assure him of the support from these benches. And Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I, I feel that sadly this is more of the same um, thoughtless, mindless attack on, on women that we've seen so often from Westminster. We know that 70 to 85 percent of cuts have been targeted at women. Um, because that level of cut can't be accidental. And who in this day and age would introduce single household payments? Um, I really do think this is a serious concern. There is a lot wrong with universal credit, and this is just a, another aspect um, that isn't fit for, for the times in which we now live. In 2013, as, as Engender and the other organisations who have contacted us on this important issue um, have stated the... The United Nations CEDAW Committee found that the universal credit single household payment poses a risk of financial abuse of women due to power imbalances in the family, particularly if payment is made to an abusive male spouse. Now, it is incumbent on us to do everything we can to change this. And, you know, I, I absolutely agree that the best thing that could happen is that this is we, we get rid of this system across the United Kingdom. However, how long is it going to take the United Kingdom government to, to take that action? Um, so while we do have a devolved government here, you know, I think there are times when it is incumbent upon us to, to take those UK policies and improve them as quickly as we possibly can with the knowledge and experience we have here. Um, fundamental change is required in this, on this issue and I will be supporting the amendment for us. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to speak to the amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't believe there can be any doubt of this government's commitment to use the remaining flexibility that we have with Universal Credit to introduce split payments. We have been clear on that, we have talked about it, we've made that commitment publicly, and we have been working with the DWP for some time now to do that. But the fact of the matter is, this is a reserved benefit. Universal Credit is a reserved benefit. 
and therefore the delivery of split payments to a household has to be negotiated with the DWP because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will deliver that or not. We have continued to have those discussions, but as members will be aware, not least members in the Social Security Committee, we had an agreement with the DWP about the abolition of bedroom tax at source. We had an agreement around a date about the abolition of bedroom tax at source. The DWP, under pressure for other priorities they considered more important, have now moved that date back a year. I make that example and I draw members' attention to that because whilst I am prepared to support this amendment, this chamber needs to be crystal clear that I can bring forward regulations, but they cannot be enacted without the DWP's agreement. And that negotiation is complicated and technical and will involve this government paying the DWP to deliver that split household payment. So I concur completely with what my colleague Ms Maguire said. Not only does uh, domestic abuse not stop at the border, but the way to resolve this properly is to continue to press the UK government with all of the uh, members in the House of Commons, our, our own benches and the Labour benches and others to come together and press the UK government to introduce this for the United Kingdom from which our members and our uh, women in this country will benefit. In the meantime, we will of course continue those discussions. I will support this amendment, but I want once again for this chamber to be absolutely clear it is not at our hand to deliver this. That is a consequence of the Scotland Act, which members in this chamber, not on these benches, but others absolutely definitely support and would not like to see us have any further powers. Of course, if we had all the powers over Social Security, we wouldn't need to be having this debate at all. Thank you. And Mark Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 144. Thank you, President Officer. In pressing Amendment 144, I'd like to thank members who have spoken in support of the amendment. I'd like to give Ms Maguire an absolute assurance that um, members um, in, of the Labour Party in this chamber and in Westminster, Westminster will be redoubling our efforts to see the solution that we are proposing across the whole of the UK as the ideal solution. But in the absence of any movement from a seemingly uncaring Tory government who wish to perpetuate a system where um, women are put at risk of financial domestic abuse, then it's right that we take the action that we can here and I ask all members to support uh, the amendment in my name and redouble their efforts uh, to, to implement this right across the whole of the UK. The question is that Amendment 144 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 15 in the name of Mark Griffin? Yes. Already debated with Amendment 41. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 94 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move formally. Move formally. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 95 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 147 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 72. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 20. I call Amendment 96 in the name of the Minister. Grouped with the amendments as shown in this grouping, Minister to move Amendment 96 and to speak to all the amendments. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, amendments 96, 97, 99 and 100 in my name increase the level of parliamentary scrutiny for certain regulations from negative to affirmative procedure. The government undertook to make these changes in its response to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's Stage 2 report. The regulation making powers affected are the powers to identify people that the Scottish Commission on Social Security can require to provide it with information and the similar powers about information sharing by and with the Scottish Ministers. 
Amendment 19 from Polly McNeill removes the ability of the Commission to decide that there are types of proposal that it does not need to consider. I said during stage two that the Scottish Government was happy to remove that power from the bill and I'm content to support Ms Neill's amendment. Amendment 101 from Mr Tompkins is to ensure that the proposals sent to the Commission for scrutiny under section 55A are sent in the form of draft regulations. As that has always been our intention, I am happy to support it, as I am happy to support Amendment 102 from Mr Tomkin. Amendment 145, lodged by Ms McNeill, proposes that all regulations made under the Bill, no matter how minor, with the sole exceptions of commencement and ancillary regulations, should be, should be subject to additional scrutiny by the Commission. This is a position that I oppose. I believe it is an odd position for Ms McNeill to be the one that is moving this amendment. During stage two, she was reasonably, I thought, particularly anxious that the Commission should not be over mighty relative to the Parliament. But the amendment that she is now pressing reflects a view expressed by the Child Poverty Action Group that any regulations not subject to scrutiny by the Commission will be subject to no independent scrutiny at all. The implication is either that the Parliament is incapable of effectively scrutinising regulations or that it lacks independence. I do not accept either of those. To be clear, those regulations that the Bill does not require to be put to the Commission will still be scrutinised by the Parliament, in most cases through affirmative procedure. The purpose of having a Commission of Experts on Social Security is, amongst other things, so that Government and Parliament will receive expert advice on complex matters of Social Security policy, the interaction between the Scottish Social Security system and the UK system, and so on. Just because regulations are made under a Social Security Act doesn't necessarily mean they raise issues requiring Social Security expertise. For example, the issues that will be raised by regulations under Section 43 conferring investigatory powers are justice matters. Regulations under subsection 2 and 5 of Section 48C are about data sharing. This Parliament is well able to scrutinise regulations on those matters and a wide range of others. It has been managing that for coming up to 20 years. And if Parliament wanted the Commission's help particularly, the Bill allows it to ask for a report. That is as it should be. The Parliament is, control, in, is in control and can take advice from whomever it wants. I therefore urge members not to support Amendment 145 and move Amendment 96. Thank you very much. I call uh, Adam Tonkins to speak to Amendment 101 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the Minister for her support for Amendments 101 and 102 in my name. Um, I support the, all of the amendments in this group except for Amendment 145, and the reasons for the Conservatives not supporting Amendment 145 are identical to the reasons just articulated by the Minister. I call on Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 16 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome what the Minister said on Amendment 16, so I'll address Amendment 145. As the Bill stands, there are important regulations, for example, on applications and decision-making on overpayment and fraud that do not need to be referred to the new Commission. The amendment places a duty on Scottish Ministers to refer proposals for regulations that are not already covered by Section 55 to the newly established Scottish Social Security Commission. The Commission may or may not decide to prepare a report, but it established a light-touch scrutiny process, and this procedure will allow for an expert independent scrutiny of often complex secondary legislation. Just to outline the... Um, sorry, just to finish. Uh, which has the potential to impact on individual rights, entitlements and experience of the Scottish Social Security system. The Commission's discretion as to whether a report is necessary will ensure scrutiny is provided in an appropriate way, without encroaching it unnecessarily on the Scottish Parliament's time or the time and the resources of the Commission. Um, so the functions that would be affected by Amendment 45 that are not currently covered would be um, the form of applications, functions of the Commission itself, the period of a redetermination for an application, 
the time period ministers are allowed to make a determination, rules around lifetime awards, automatic payments, investigation and investigation making powers, in particular to enter and search as well as creating offences, top up on all the powers and rules round about them, care is supplement as to who is a qualifying person, power to repeal, care is supplement, information sharing, naming new persons and persons who they can share with, DH, the discretionary housing payment rules and who the commission can extract relevant information from and the numbers that make up the commission. It's quite a long list of uh, issues which do not currently require to go to the commission and uh, on the balance I felt that these the Commission should have the opportunity to prepare a report, should it so wish. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And I call on the Minister to wind up in this group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I will be brief. I'm only going to concentrate on Amendment 145. There is a presumption behind that amendment that no Commission scrutiny equals no scrutiny at all. That is not the case. This Parliament has a critical role which it has developed with some expertise over the years to scrutinise. And the bill gives the Parliament the uh, power to ask the Commission for advice if it so wishes. So I would urge members not to support Amendment 145. It will incur unnecessary delay in some instances in terms of regulations we would wish to move quickly on, in which I'm sure the Parliament may support us in that. But it will always be down to this Parliament to determine whether those regulations are approved or not approved. Thank you very much. The question, therefore, I will state the question is that Amendment 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 97 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 98 in the name of the Minister already debated? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 99 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 100 in the name of the Minister. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 101 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated. Adam Tompkins to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 102 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated. Adam Tompkins to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 102 to be agreed, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated. Pauline McNeill to move. Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 145 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated. Polly McNeill to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 145 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division on this amendment, and this will be a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. The question is that Amendment 145 be agreed. One minute. The result of the vote on amendment number 145 in the name of Polly McNeill is yes, 31, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call amendment 103 in the name of the minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 103 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
Can I call Amendment 104 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 19. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 104 be... Oh, sorry. Can I call Amendment 104A in the name of the Minister, already debated? Minister to move formally. Moved. That is moved. So, first question is that Amendment 104A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is now that Amendment 104, as amended, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, all in the name of the Minister, and invite the Minister to move the amendments on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object if I put the question on block? No one objects. The question is that Amendments 105 to 110 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 111 in the name of the Minister? Already debated. Minister to move. Not moved. Not moved. Not moved. Does anyone else wish to move Amendment 111? No one does. Can I call Amendment 148 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 53. Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 148 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 112 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 113 to 123, all in the name of the Minister, and invite the Minister to move Amendments 113 to Amendments 123 on block. Moved on block. Moved on block. Does anyone object if I put the question on block? No. The question is that Amendments 113 to 123 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now that ends consideration of amendments. And at this stage, members will be aware I am now required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of this bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, anything that modifies the electoral system in Scotland. In the case of this bill, no provision does any of this, anything of the sort. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. Now, I propose that we just take a short break before we move on to the debate stage, and we will resume at five to. So we've come back in eight minutes time at five to six. Okay. Parliament suspended for a few minutes. <laughs>